Okay, thank you. All right, uh, welcome everybody to the Committee of the Whole meeting for Wednesday, February the 23rd, 2022. Um, I, the mayor is not able to be here for this meeting, so I will chair it. Um, however, I'm told that he will arrive for the special meeting. I'll call this meeting to order. I have a motion moved by Councillor Noble. Sorry, it's written wrong. Moved by Councillor Noble, seconded by Councillor Massey that the committee of members, oh no, that's the agenda. Okay, do I, I don't have a, a motion for opening the meeting. You're reading it. Okay, I'm not reading these then. Okay, good. Councillor Noble, go ahead. <laughs> the agenda of the Committee of the Whole on Wednesday, February 23rd, 2022. Thank you, Councillor Noble. All in favor of the motion? Carried, thank you. Additions. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I just last night's weather reminded me that I don't believe we discussed or passed a resolution where we can watch on Zoom from home and our vote would count. I don't know how we had to discuss that if we had to pass anything because obviously the federal government's doing it right now. So I'm not sure what the what we have okay, to do. Okay. So this is so in addition to other business. Okay. And what what would you like to call it? A uh... Zoom vote. Zoom, Zoom weather bylaw. Yeah, sure. Zoom vote. Okay, we'll discuss that under seven other business. Is there anything, any other changes to the agenda? Seeing none. All in favor? Carry. Thank you. All right, declarant. <laughs> okay, we're doing this backwards. Any declaration of pecuniary interest and in nature thereof? Okay, we're good to go. Uh, under item number five, staff reports, we'll start with the Community Services Department. Go ahead, Anne. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm pleased to bring you our report for February, and I'll start with the administration side of things. Um, further to Council's approval, we have just received the contract to uh, enter into um, the regist registration and recreation software with booking. So once we get that finalized, we're going to be implementing the new booking software. And as we mentioned, that will be done alongside with our existing software to make sure that it is up and running and well established prior to switching over. We have scheduled the business and community awards gala. There's an error in the report. I indicated uh, September 10th. It's actually on Thursday, September 8th. We'll be sending out an invitation to council in that respect. We also have been speaking with the Eastern Ontario Health Unit about reopening the community kitchens program. As you know, because of COVID, the health unit has redirected all of their efforts towards vaccination clinics. But now that things are moving into a new chapter, we're hoping to be able to reopen the community kitchens. We know that there's a dire need from small producers to be able to access those spaces. The health uh, unit is also continuing with the vaccination clinics until the end of um, February, possibly into the first week of March, but they've indicated that their uh, train of thought is leading them to move to the health unit spaces that they have on Enix Street, and that they will most likely be doing their vaccination clinics from there. So I think what they've noticed is that the numbers have been dropping over the last while, and that that space would probably accommodate them better. We are in our last year for our geese mitigation program. As you know, we had a three-year permit for that process. We are going to be reapplying again for another three-year permit, hopefully from 2023 to 2025. As you know, that's always contingent upon a, a review by the Ministry of Natural Resources. So we are very hopeful with the way that we've been managing things. And we often say this, this is a management program, not an extinction, extinction or an extermination program. There will always be geese here. It's just a matter of making sure that it's appropriate for our, our population here. So that report is always reviewed by the Ministry of Natural Resources, and they do so prior to issuing the permits. 
In regards to grant applications, Council was advised that we uh, were successful in obtaining $490,000 for the HVAC system for Maxville. Uh, we also applied for the Celebrate Canada Fund for Canada Day. We're hoping to hear back from them in March. That's typically the time frame that we get a response from them. We applied to the Community Revitalization Grant for the Skate Park. And again, we are hopeful to be hearing back from them positively in that respect. And uh, we are looking at possibly applying to the Seniors Community Grant this year with South Glengarry, doing something jointly as a Glengarry instead of going it alone. We have our health and safety meetings that uh, we attend monthly for all of our facilities. Our next one is scheduled for tomorrow. The ice schedule, as you know, uh, due to being closed in January um, due to COVID, we have had to reschedule a lot of minor hockey and uh, junior beagle ends and Mustangs games. So we've had to contact different organizations and shuffle things around. We've been very, very proactive. Whenever we know that a team doesn't have their regular spot, we've been contacting them by email to remind them that week that you're not on on Wednesday as per usual because games were reshuffled. So um, staff, I have to thank them very much for keeping on top of that because that is quite complex when you're trying to reschedule you know, some seven or eight games that were lost during those periods in the two week period. So I know that I was speaking with the Glengarry girls and in one weekend, one team had four games. So, and that's extremely unusual. We also performed an, an inventory of all of our equipment. We did that following the capital budget being passed and we wanted to ensure that all that information was available for the asset management plan. We are going to be proceeding with the removal of noxious aquatic vegetation from Mill Pond. I actually had a conversation with Mr. Uh, Colby Nolan from uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans about this project. And uh, he has given me the verbal, okay, I'm still waiting for the letter of intent from them, giving us all the fine details. But he told us that he's really pleased with the way the township has been, been managing that program. And he also indicated that if we wanted to extend that program further to our uh, July 15th date that we should apply for a wider permit and usually those are just it's basically a stamp of approval it's just to let them know that we're proceeding with these uh, this removal once we are out of spawning season with the fish. We also had a conversation regarding the pilot project for Loch Gary, and I was um, in contact with Mr. Brendan Jacobs from the RCA, who kindly supplied some information regarding Loch Gary. So they wanted to know depth, kinds of species that could possibly be at risk in that body of water. As you know, we are dammed, so there are some species that don't make their way down. And uh, Mr. Jacobs kindly provided all of that information to DFO. And again, they said that they seem to be very favorable to that project, but we are waiting for the LOI for that project also. We'll re bring that information forward to council. We have been working on the tree distribution program. Um, Councillor uh, Massey, myself, and Peter Bach had a call yesterday on uh, this project trying to determine how best to do some reforestation in North Glengarry. What was decided was uh, that we're going to be able to uh, capture some information from other parties that have done the same thing. So we've enlisted the help of Mr. Ben DeHaan from the counties, as well as Mr. Pat Pitts from South Nation Conservation Authority. And we're going to be meeting here at Island Park on my March 8th, along with Mr. Bach and possibly a few more volunteers to discuss one area in the township that could be really benefit from reforestation and how we could canvas some volunteers to do that day. So we have that scheduled again for March 8th at one o'clock. I'll uh, leave the committee activities to uh, our committee chairs. Regards um, to our events and activities, we have our Boys and Girls Club that started again once the COVID restrictions were lifted. We've already scheduled some ball hockey activities uh, for Maxville, and that will be starting in May. We expect that the ice will be in until at least the 17th of April. We've just booked the Ranger tournament for two weekends, and that's a, a wonderful tournament that's uh, area-wide. We also have the fishing derby, as you know, that happened this Saturday. And uh, even though it was blizzard-like conditions, there were 900 registrants to this wow. activity. Usually, um, they have about 2,000 registrants, but we were limited to the amount of individuals. We worked out a safety plan with the health unit, and we had uh, committed to not having more than 1,000 registrants to the activity. And what happened with that is, uh, due to a question of logistics, 
the registration date had to be moved up. So there had to be a firm registration date where usually a lot of individuals were able to access the fishing derby here on location register that morning. So, but still we consider it a success having 900 individuals. It's one of the first large events that we've been able to host in the township since the beginning of COVID. The Glengarry Soccer League has res resumed its activities also indoors at the Dome, so we're pleased to have that going on, as well as uh, other activities like karate, uh, the home version of the Kilt Skate. We are also pleased to be offering two days of camp for March break at the Tim Hortons Dome. Registration open today, so the spaces are limited. We still want to respect the fact that we have COVID and ensure that we don't end up with larger groups and we can manage safely. So we encourage anyone who wants uh, to have their children attend these camps to contact the Tim Hortons Dome and complete a registration form. Sports ball again has been very popular. It's being held on Saturday mornings and we have uh, young, young ones. So starting at three years old that are registered in that program. And uh, I'm sure it's going to be a repeat again for the fall. We have our summer camp starting in Alexandria. We've um, already been in contact with the Boys and Girls Club. So the organization of that activity is ongoing. And we have contacted Youth Unlimited about using the facilities in Maxville for their summer camp again for the 2022 season. The ladies volleyball um, is a great success. We have 10 teams registered and that happens on Wednesdays and yoga programming will be ongoing with another spring session starting in late March. In respect to our facilities, we are working with a local contractor to uh, build the stand for the condenser. So we're in uh, the preliminary stages of that. We've actually contacted McIntosh Perry for um, some stamping of some plans, engineering plans. We were able to mimic some plans that had been used by another facility, but they still have to be peer reviewed by McIntosh Perry and we're in the process of doing that right now. At Island Park, we've ordered the new place structure. As you know, council approved that as part of the capital budget. So we're expecting delivery in spring for that. In Maxwell, we did have an issue with some sewage drains freezing up. And uh, we uh, really appreciate the fact that Dean came over to see the situation with us in Maxville. And we realized that this is something that we're going to have to address in the spring. Uh, there's either a slope issue that makes that uh, the water staying in this drain and uh, really freezing up we had capital steam come over and they were not able to fix the situation so what we've done is we've installed a sump pump but that is very uh, very much a temporary measure and something that's going to have to be addressed in the spring and the engineers are now working on the hvac design system for maxville so in respect to the tim horton stone we had family day happen there on monday and we put out toys that were easy to disinfect we know that that uh, um, activity or that event or availability of uh, activities at the Tim Hortons Dome was again very successful. Same as in Maxville, we had an inordinate amount of skaters come out on uh, Monday for that activity, so I'm, I think it was greatly appreciated by the public. And we are also following up at the Tim Hortons Dome with the Farley Group. As you know, we've noticed some deterioration of the membrane, and we've been trying to get them to come out to piggyback on uh, another repair that they have to do at a dome either in Ottawa, because we don't want to pay for them to come out to look for the dome. That would be uh, an inordinate, uh, inordinately expensive charge for them to come out. So we're hoping to be able to have that looked at and uh, hopefully tested before the spring. In respect to other uh, activities, you'll see that the Economic Development uh, Department has been extremely busy. We were able to um, piggyback on some video that is being done with the, the storm at Dundas and Glengarry counties. They came out on Monday and Tuesday of last week, and we took some footage and some B-roll in Maxville with some of our businesses in some of our facilities. And this is part of our residential marketing and attraction that we are doing under the development and marketing strategy. So this is a component that's moving forward very well. We also have the commercial gap analysis that's being performed and the firm is uh, coming to our next community development committee to present their findings. And these are preliminary findings that are going to be reviewed by the committee and will be coming to council at a further date. The My Main Street program has started with uh, Daryl assuming the functions of ambassador for that. And as usual, we keep, uh, forwarding any information that comes from government sources to our chambers to our businesses 
And uh, the other important thing uh, that I have to mention is that Natalie has been doing a fantastic job when it comes to communications. You've seen her do uh, some live shots um, and posting them to Facebook and we're garnering really great traction through this. And we've been having a lot of people following the township page. So I know that they look sometimes like, um, you know, little uh, fluff pieces, if you wish. But what's important for us is that anybody who follows a township, when they see pieces like this, they also get information concerning garbage and recycling distribution, and any, you know, road conditions or activities have, that have to be postponed. So we're able to reach larger audiences. So we have to thank her for the work that she's doing right now. So thank you, Madam Chair, that's my report. Thank you very much, Anne. <clears throat> uh, Jacques, can you please put the motion on the table and then uh, I'll ask for questions and comments afterwards. I never thought I'd, I'd say this, but I would kind of miss Jamie in these times. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, Carmen. Uh, move on myself, seconded by Councillor Noble, that the Committee of the Whole receives report CS 2022-01, the Departmental work, mat, work Plan Update, February 2022, from the Community Services Department for information purposes only. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Uh, are there any questions from councillors or comments for Anne? Yes, go ahead. Uh, just a couple of comments, uh, Anne, for me. Uh, for yep. me. Uh, just uh, regarding the ice fishing tournament, I was there, so it was uh, it was a nice, it was a it was a day like we had a <laughs> I took a video of it while the squall was coming down so but uh, just to add on that like there's at least like it's a great uh, event for uh, Northern Gary and I, I've seen uh, what I could figure out is about 50% of outside outsiders mm -hmm. uh, so that's a great uh, we should jump on that uh, train to promote it a little bit better I think because they didn't really do a I know you said they were a bit late with the COVID stuff but uh, a lot of people didn't even know it, it was happening that day. So, uh, um, so it, if we couldn't next year, maybe get in contact with them, and I'm, I'm pretty sure they would uh, like us to promote it a little bit better, help them promote it because it's a great, great draw for uh, Alexandria and the Glengarry. And also on the tree committee, thank you very much, Anne, for taking that over. Uh, uh, taking she uh, we did a really had good uh, meeting yesterday. We did a Zoom with Pete Buck and. Uh, they're gonna Pete's gonna talk to his group the uh, Glengarry neighbors I think uh, friends of the Glengarry uh, so they're gonna enlist maybe a couple more uh, committee members and invitation is out there for anyone on this council if they want to join in too like maybe one or two more it's just that it would get more transparency to uh, the, the thing and also I don't know if you mentioned it, uh, Tim maybe uh, like on public course when we if we adopt a green road to a uh, reef forest, like on the sides and everything, we'd like the participation or just the guidance of public works, the road department, just to tell us if there's uh, any ditches there or, uh, uh, you know, lines of, uh, so we might be uh, knocking on your door just to give us a little, because we're, the next meeting will be the process to start, uh, I think, uh, uh, adopting one project for this year. And then we're gonna try to reline uh, a green road that has been uh, cleaned up completely to the to the gravel there so that's the plan so we might uh, uh, ask you for advice or something on that thing that's it thank you and if i may uh, uh, uh councillor massey will be uh doing a call out to volunteers so anybody who feels like coming out to plant some trees we'll let you know the date and time and location thank you councillor massey I, i'm really glad to hear that you're involving <clears throat> the the public in this in this initiative because it'll it, you know people want to get involved in this kind of thing because it's it's good news it's helping the environment and you know it it gives a really good message uh and and i think it would also be a good idea when you have the date for the tree pickup if you could please let council know so that maybe we can be out there you know giving the trees away to the the public i think it's uh be nice to see council involved in that anyone who's available um i just have a two other uh, one other question with regards to lock gary and you said that there's a pilot um for going a pilot project with regards to clearing weeds there 
So you, through you, Madam Chair, yes, actually that had been brought to Council previously. Uh, we had had a request to see if it was possible to make some improvements to Lock Gary. It is a very small project. We're looking at doing about the equivalent of what we do here. So it may not look like much, but it is so much uh, more than just that. It's really a pilot to show the DFO that we might be able to impact a certain area and possibly extend further in the future. And when we did discuss this with Public Works, we had to be very conscious of the fact that we can't go and stretch out our resources beyond what we have. So if we're able to do this successfully, and if it's Council's desire to extend the area that needs to be cleaned up, we'll have to put together a plan for that, including you know staff costs, staff time, possibly equipment, because that means moving the harvester in and out of the pond. So it's it's much larger than just saying, okay, we're going ahead and cleaning out a, an area. Oh. So there's a lot of thought being given to this. Okay, good. That's precisely why I asked the question, because I could see this, um, you know, all of a sudden there's an, we need two harvesters. And I mean, it's desirable to clean up Lock Gary, if at all possible, but, you know, within we need, yeah, we need we need a plan for sure, and I think it's important until until we do have a plan, um, you know, to keep people's expectations in in check so that we don't they don't think it's going to be sort of crystal blue water tomorrow or something. <laughs> okay, that, that was just uh, what I had in mind there. Any other questions or comments from Anne? So. Through you, Madam Chair, if I may, um, there is going to be a communications component that's going to be accompanying the pilot project as well as the tree project. So we realize that, and we discussed that uh, yesterday during our meeting with Mr. Bach, that if uh, the green road allowance is along a farm or an area like that, that we're going to get that farmer's involvement. And we're going to be putting up signage there. And we're going to be working with Natalie again to put out some press releases and to do you know, so, some photography and video and so on and so forth. Really a good sensibili sensibilization campaign for that. And the thin same thing is going to be done with Lock Gary, just so the community does understand that this is very much a pilot project. So, and you know, when we know what the area is here at Mill Pond, and it looks huge because it's what we see here, but in Lock Gary, if you put it in reference, it's a very, very, very small portion of Lock Gary, and it's to see what kind of an impact we can have, and if it's feasible at our end. Very good. That, that sounds like a good plan. Are you going to check to see if there are any weevils left? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't hear that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Anne. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> next is the Treasury Department. Now, Brenda, can you put the motion on the table, please? TR 2022-7, the Departmental Work Plan Update, February 2022 from the Treasury Department for information purposes only. Thank you. Go ahead, Kim. Welcome. Um, building assessments are now complete <clears throat> and the information is being formatted to upload into the citywide software. Along with this, the bridge, uh, culvert and roads need studies will also be uh, put into that asset management software. And um, not only that, we're gonna upload the entire studies. There is a way to do it, I don't know yet how. But that way we have a central storage for all our asset information. This will also assist with capital budgeting, hopefully for 2023. We have a county representative who's coming down for a day in March, and she's going to assist myself, the director of public works and the public works assistant. I think that's her title. Anyways, with uh, getting some of this information into the software. Uh, tax collection remains very good. Uh, your report says there's nine properties still in the process for tendering. This is now down to six. We had three of those customers pay this week, and we had another one pay last Friday, and the four of them totaled $78,000. So it's coming along. We also have three tenders that are planned to be opened on March 17th for three properties. Uh, and then eight additional pro properties will be starting the process soon. It takes about a year for it to go through, but we're starting on eight more. Uh, the municipal audit is taking place from February 28th to March 11th, so the Treasury Department and other departments that are involved in the audit have been getting all the documentation ready for the auditors. Um, 
This is so we have our year end earlier than we have in the past couple of years. You know, there was one year when we got our financial statements in October and it made it difficult to manage because the financials were not rolled into the next year. So uh, it will be earlier this year. Uh, the department's planning for two new policies for 2022. We'll see how that goes. And the remainder of the items on this report are basically normal operations for the Treasury Department. So my report looks very small compared to Anne's. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not, I'm not going to ask the question. And any, thank you, Kim. You're welcome. Thank you. We know you work hard. Don't worry. It's okay. No, I, I know you I'm work just hard. Like, okay, I got two paragraphs. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, questions or comments from council members? Look, at, you answered all the all the questions go. in those <laughs> paragraphs as well. Thank you, council. Thank you very much. All right, you've all heard the motion. Uh, all in favor of the motion? Carried. Thank you. All right, we're on to C building planning and bylaw department. Councillor uh, Manley, please put the motion on the table. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Moving myself, seconded by Councillor Madden, that the Committee of the Whole receives report BP 2022 06, the departmental work plan update February 2022 from the building uh, bylaw and planning department for information purposes only. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, so uh, what's new? So the first one, hiring of the administrative assistant. Uh, as you know, there's been a bit of a staffing change in the department. So we've uh, come to an agreement with the counties to get uh, Peter Young to work with us to do the biggest, uh, I guess the, the big planning files. And we're in the process of hiring a new admin assistant for, um, so Chantal moves, she, she took the, the planning aspect of the, of the department. So we're hiring a new admin assistant to help uh, building and bylaw. We've had some uh, some very good applicants, so this will be uh, continued in the next uh, in the next week, I guess. Uh, Maxville projects. So as you know, uh, we've been working alongside with uh, Waterworks and a lot with the plumbers in Maxville to know uh, when the when the remainder of the properties are being connected, so we can do go and do the inspection right away. Uh, so there's no backlog in there. We're pretty much up to date. It's just a question of getting everybody connected. Uh, building permits. So a little update for uh, for the end of the year. Uh, so in 2021, we have issued 250 building permits, and the value of construction of these permits. So that's not the actual money we're we're we're, we're taking in for the permits. Sadly, it's the, the actual value of the building. Uh, so 22 million 455. Uh, just to compare to last year in 2020, so yeah, there was the pandemic and everything, but uh, as I mentioned, there was not a real, real big hit in the construction uh, department. So last year, we've issued 226 permits for 12, pretty much $13 million. So um, there's a big increase there. We've been, uh, we've been busy. We see it. Uh, most of these large sums uh, come from uh, some industrial development in McEwen. So I don't know if you saw these, there's a, a lot of new buildings there, dome buildings, stuff like that. Uh, the vet clinic, of course, uh, large agricultural projects and a lot of residential permits. So there's been, especially um, late last year and coming into this year, there's a lot of uh, single family uh, dwelling applications. So that's going well. Uh, just a little update on uh, large projects. Uh, so the site plan for the animal hospital, as you probably saw it, it's going really well. Uh, the structure is all up. Uh, we did, we just did the plumbing inspection in there. So uh, insulation, and then they're going to board. And they got in touch with me to know exactly what they needed for their occupancy. So they're looking at when they can open and stuff like that. So I, I believe they're aiming at like April around that. So it's it's going really well over there. Um, the fourplex on St. George, so Ron Thierry's property, this is going to start in March. We just issued this building permit. Um, apartment complex in Maxville, so the old school. This is also going really well. I just did the plumbing inspection over there, and he's starting the drywall. Um, so IHA, I'll just talk about it later, but uh, basically they're, uh, they're well into their site plan control development also. Uh, and there's a trucking depot that's going to go this year. Uh, just south of town here. 
uh, yeah, so a lot of building permit application, large projects, and a lot of single family dwellings for uh, coming in for next year. Um, so bylaw enforcement, uh, there's not a whole lot new going on in the bylaw enforcement. It's really just uh, complaints coming in. Uh, COVID restrictions are starting to be very hard to enforce, as you know. So we're just trying to keep up. Todd is working really well with the OPP, so it's, it's going good for that. Uh, set fines, again, we didn't do it yet, but we want to uh, get some set fines for most of our bylaws. Uh, the planning department, so for subdivisions, I mentioned, I think at the last meeting that the township was looking into doing some kind of a standards or guideline for subdivisions. So we just had a meeting this morning, actually, with the counties, and uh, Peter wants to do something more uh, similar across the county. So uh, what he's proposing is he's going to, to use uh, some guidelines that existing, uh, some existing guidelines from other townships and try to, to, to do a guideline that, would, that could be used across the county. So most of the planners seem to be on board. Um, they're pretty much using the same one as of now, so it wouldn't change anything for them. So that would be useful. So we're kind of on the hold for that, but this would be a good idea. That for uh, subdivisions and for site plans, actually. So the application would be the same across the county. So it's uh, with Peter Young over there, it's going really well for planning. Uh, severances, we have a lot of severances coming in, but that again, with our new arrangements with the counties, uh, this will be a lot easier for us as we pretty much just flip them to the counties at, as they are the approval authority. And what's going to happen is that they are going to put in the conditions on our part. They're going to send it back to us and we're just going to say, yes, we're okay with that or change this or whatever. So this should be good. Uh, the IHA project, so we have the presentation coming. Uh, basically, they're, uh, they're well into their site plan agreement, so they're going to present what they have now. Uh, and the LPAT appeal, so uh, as of February 15, uh, the appeal was finally approved, so it only took four years, not bad. They're due for their uh, next review coming in next year, but whatever, that's okay. Uh, they have to do their, uh, their schedule, uh, advert, like tell everybody like, whose properties is switching, they have to let them know. And from there, it's going to be official that the new OP is going to be in effect. And from there, so that's a, that was one of the big steps we were waiting for to update our zoning bylaw, because our zoning has to match the OP. So now we're going to be able to update our zoning bylaw to match what the OP has changed with this, uh, with this appeal now. And uh, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Excellent. Thank you, Jacob. Questions, comments for Jacob? Gee, you answered everybody's questions too. Just, one, just uh, I have one. Oh. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, it, just with regards to the the hookups for water in Maxville. Yeah. Approximately how many are not ho hooked up, and and are they? Forty-seven. And and are they? simply not well, going to hook up yeah Are they just uh, gonna we're pay not it? sure at this point we're, we're trying to get a hold of them some of the people we can't even talk to because they don't answer but uh... i see why right, there's, there's a lot of them it's like it's it's with the plumbers like right now also it's winter so a, a lot of them i know Pretty much all of uh, what's the street north of Maxville there, the roundabout there? Campbell. Campbell, right? They're pretty much all waiting on on the plumbers to do it. They're all ready to go. So that is the situation for some of them. So it's it's not always the landowner. Sometimes it's right. the plumber. Sometimes it's just bad timing. So okay, but that's it, there's there's not a lot of um, complaints going on with regards to that. It's pretty smooth. No, I think. Okay. All right, I thought it had started. Okay. Um, and then uh, just with regards to those subdivision guidelines you were talking about, yeah. is there, what are the advantages and the disadvantages of, um, of having sort of a uniform sort of across right. the entire of SD and G? It's, it's a, as far as I'm concerned, it's a very good idea because it's, it's easier for like, it's because you always get the same people. If I can take, for example, like EVB in uh, Cornwall, I think. 
So they work for like pretty much four, four townships. So if they would have the same guideline to, to use for, and mind you, the guy working for EVB used to do these guidelines for two of the townships. So it's like they know it by heart. And right now there's just little things different from one to another. So having it like the same actual document for across the counties would be good. It's And also it's just the thing we, we would not have to do with basically, like it would just come to us all ready to go. And it's the it's usually the same, like before it's being approved, uh, Tim would go through it. And if he sees, like what Peter was saying is if one township wants to have something in particular in there, he would just add it for everybody. So if this township wants to use that clause or whatever, or that particular cross section for road or for blah, 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 they could use that detail in particular. So it would be more like, total document where you can use detail A5 instead of A4 and blah, blah, blah. So right. it's, it sounded like a very good idea. Okay, yeah, sounds, sounds good. And Thanks. right now we have nothing. So that's the hard thing where people ask us questions and yeah. we don't even know what, what to give them. So yeah. well. That's great. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for your report. Okay, you heard the motion earlier. All, all in favor? Carried, thank you. All right, now we're on to public works. Um, I'm sorry, who has got, uh, Councillor Madden, if you could please put. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Wensink, the Committee of the Whole receives report PW 2022-04, the Departmental Work Plan update, February 2022, from the Public Works Department for information purposes only. Thank you, Councillor Madden. Go ahead, Tim. Welcome. Thank you, Council. Um, so uh, we started off in 2022 with a rocky start with Omicron. Um, luckily, with the fire department, we were able to uh, procure some uh, rapid testing tests. So we rolled that out uh, to each of the work sites and uh, we built uh, stations there that automatically recorded as people did tests. Uh, this was very successful and we actually caught a lot of false no, sorry, we, we caught a lot of cases that were asymptomatic. So people who had no symptoms whatsoever, and if they didn't test, they would have just gone to work and spread it to the next person. So very successful. And we thank the fire department for uh, helping us out to get those tests. And uh, we had really good uptake as well. It was a voluntary program and uh, we had a good um, participation through all of the, all the departments. And um, I thank all of them for, for doing the right thing and testing to keep their, their co-workers safe. Um, you can see the graph there, the uptake, and it's dropped off now. Um, the, we haven't had any positives for uh, quite a few weeks. Um, and uh, we, expect that to, uh, we expect that to drop off people are, less worried about it now we've also the people who have been positive aren't going to be positive again uh so it's uh, uh it's going in the right direction and we're really glad that we got this out at the very start um on to the roads so the roads department um the blade installs that were done in 2021 were very successful so it's saving us a lot on salt sand and grit um on the gravel roads, especially. Uh, and as you've probably noticed with our recent weather, it gives us a good amount of traction um, when you're on those gravel roads. Uh, the we've had this isn't in the report because it's been very, very recent, but our uh, the recent weather we've had starting on Friday, uh, all of the workers have been doing fairly regular 12 hour shifts with 3 a.m. starts snow removal um, they did a really good job just before christmas making sure that all the streets were clear for uh um for christmas so everyone can have those uh those get-togethers when they you know around uh, covid restrictions um so the team's been doing really really well and uh, we really appreciate their work um so we also have uh when moving on to fleet we have the main problem that we've had is with the maxville uh, sidewalk tractor. Uh, so luckily we held on to the old sidewalk tractor and that had been doing duty for us. Uh, that tractor is now back in service. 
uh, and that mechanical issue seemed to be resolved. I think it was electronic actually, so uh, that's all resolved now. Uh, we have had minor issues with the tandems uh, that is indicative of just our aging fleet. Um, so now that we've approved to get the extra new tandems, that should uh, go quite a way to alleviating that issue. Um, then in actually moving on to water and sewer. So in Alexandria, uh, we had uh, two breaks, um, two water breaks, both on Dominion Street um, that we brought in. Uh, we had to bring in some contractors to help help us fix that as well, to operate the backhoes and excavate. Um, both breaks were uh, at valve stems, so um, it's on their, on their connection side. Um, and uh, both the teams responded. We didn't have any boil water advisories or anything like that. No, no issues with water quality, uh, but the guys did well to respond to those issues. Um, we are fine tuning the water dosing, sorry, the chemical dosing in the Alexandria water treatment plant uh, and bringing in a consultant uh, to try and get a, an outside view of what we're doing and make sure that we can really optimize those uh, dosing. Um, of the of the water as it comes in, we have a uh, low chlorine. No. Angela will go more into detail later. I'll let her explain it so I don't bungle it. But um, but basically, we're we're fine tuning the chemical dosing in the Alexandria water plant. On the sewage side, uh, the team has been doing a really good job of uh identifying dean specifically identifying and uh plugging leaks in the sewage system so we're getting a lot of water infiltration with uh roots going into the pipes and uh just uh the expansion contraction uh, getting breaks in the pipes here and there so we cctv those in the spring of 2020 and in the autumn um, and over the winter as well have been having contractors basically plug the holes in those pipes and what that means is that with less water infiltration into the sewage system that eases the load on our on our back end on our uh, lagoons uh, so that's been really good uh, we did a 90 meter section um, that was relined in the fall and uh, we plan to do more in 2022 uh, we had a power outage on December 11th. Uh, I believe we also had a recent power outage. I can't remember the date. Um, that was very brief, uh, but the teams hooked up um, the generators and pumps that were needed to make sure that we don't get any backups anywhere. Um, so that was really good and a good test of our emergency emergency response. Um, in Maxville, as Jacob mentioned, we still have uh, 49 residents. Um, who haven't hooked up for whatever reason, various reasons, as we went over before. Um, and the, they have been sent a letter that they will be starting to be billed in uh, early 2022. So is that? Um, so at the landfill, we had to modify uh, the way that the, the waste was, uh, the waste was sitting so we could manage it better in the future. Um, well, not manage it better, but just deal with the amount that we've got. Basically, as the piles get higher, it all needed to be, not all of it, but a portion needed to be moved and consolidated in one area. Um, so that was completed uh, early this year. Um, moving on to drainage, uh, we did uh, 53 kilometers of, uh, of drain in the 2021 2022 season, uh, sorry, by the end of the season, that is. Um, oh, sorry, 53, yeah, 53 kilometers of drain that would be maintained. Um, uh, thanks, to, Zoe's been uh, managing all of that and doing really well. Uh, with the new bylaw uh, that was introduced for the, uh, the policy of only accepting, uh, only accepting requests to maintain a drain before a certain date, of the year is really going to help that. So we're going to have a much smoother year in the 2022-2023 season, uh, which is good. We we'll look forward to that. Um, 
And then on to Rare. So Rare has been doing well, uh, selling commodities as per the CIF pricing, which we included there for your reference. Um, we've signed hazardous waste agreements uh, in, um, sorry, we've signed some hazardous waste agreements so we can get subsidized for uh, taking the hazardous waste. We provide that service to the community. Um, the next date will be in early April. Um, the blue box regulation, uh, there's ongoing webinars and there's actually even another one today trying to figure out how exactly this transition is going to work. Um, that will basically move full responsibility for recycling to the producers. Um, and there's certain thresholds that figure out what requirements there are for producers, depending on how much that they actually, uh, how much they actually make. Um, so we, our next milestone for that is we have to register as a processor in late April. Basically what that means is that uh, we're putting out, we're going on a, a database that tells these processors who are going to be responsible that we have a, a waste sorting facility here and uh, they may approach us to see uh, how that can fit into their responsibility in the future. Uh, we don't transition until 2025, so there's quite a way until uh, that response, responsibility actually moves to them. Uh, we also have to repair some items for insurance. There's two exterior walls uh, that still need to be done um, that uh, we're going to do this year. Uh, we did get one successful quote, um, but it, we, if that quote uh, is too high, we may, may actually do this in-house. It is fairly simple work. We might uh, have some of the public works guys join forces with Rare there and, uh, and get this work done. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Anybody have any questions? Okay, go ahead, uh, Councillor Wensink, then uh, Councillor Massey. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Wow, nice. <laughs> yeah, same here. Uh, Tim, it's really uh, easy to read, easy to focus on. I suggest, like, that I'm looking at these exterior walls and I know where they are, but maybe putting a, like a, a blocker because I know I think people are stashing stuff on that wall and that's that why deteriorate like that. So if you put a stopper or a barrier before that wall, that makes it bollards or something. That's another thing. Come up. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. And a few years ago, four or five years ago, I had the previous public works guy to look into buying a, um, a screen to put on that fence, you know, just to block off because sometimes it gets uh, disorganized a little bit in that yard. You would just block that view from residents walking by or something. It just some days look worse than other it's just like a screen that you would put up on the fence and just you know you know what i mean like yep yeah okay yeah we can plant trees there <laughs> go ahead councillor madden thank you deputy mayor um tim just a quick question about uh calendars waste calendars yep. information for the community we have any dates or any info on when that's coming out i thought that they were already out but i could check on that so for you play with you yeah. yeah oh, yeah, they went out a month ago. Really? Not a lot actually made it. We need to talk about communications to my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I didn't I, get one either. Yeah, I know the mail. Oh. <laughs> no. They were they were mailed? Yeah. Okay, so, but how, what, what happens if your tax bill is, uh, is, is paid by your financial institution? Does that come from you, Kim? Does that, does that come from you? The final tax bill, like once it, it it's uh, 
No, so so how do we how do we make sure we don't miss people? I guess is what I'm is what I'm because if we if two of us were missed in this small group and you didn't get one either, then that means probably a lot of people were missed. Yes, go ahead, Councillor. Yeah. Yeah, not in not in urban areas. Can I can I make a suggestion, Sarah? You can address this at, at your SMT, your senior management team, and I mean maybe for these kinds of things, we uh, like a direct mail. Because you have everyone's address. A direct mail is the way to go. It's not that ex it's not that expensive. Let's go ahead. And they, that's a rule they have. You have to have where you live and your house. Oh, yes, go ahead. What we try to do is for those um, letters that have come back to us without a field block, whatever email, whatever phone number we have on the tackle, we try to contact people, but really it's the owner's responsibility to ensure that those addresses are correct. We have tried. It's going above and beyond and making sure it's appreciated. Yeah, okay. I, I can confirm as well that those calendars were sent out in December with Canada Post. Jessica must be watching. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, sorry, who wanted to so, uh, Another thing I've been asking a few years ago, it's just to, to maybe replenish their, some of the people's uh, blue boxes, because some of them are pretty damaged. And I, I know there's money in the budget for rare, or like, uh, or something. Like, I, I don't say replenish everybody, but if you replenish 50 a year or something, that'd be nice down the road. Because if you go take a road uh, tour today and you look at the boxes, some of them are, it's like, well, they're taped, like, are barely holding on, so that people would appreciate getting in boxes again because we stopped that. Okay, any other comments? Go, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and I was go just going to bring up if we could, if we could do something, I don't know what, to help with Canada Post because I have been to Hawkesbury, I have spoken to Ottawa, I have diggity as much as I can because in our part of the world, we no longer put mail in the box. And when I went to Hawkesbury, they said, oh, no, we stopped picking up mail three years ago. Nobody mentioned that to us. Uh, they don't have to put up flags. They don't have to do anything anymore. Um, neighbors have had to build second mailboxes because we don't stop there anymore, even though we stopped there for 20 years. So I'm just wondering, since you're actually, I mean, it's one thing if we get mail because he doesn't feel like coming down our roads. So we only get mail about twice a week now. But that we can live with. But if you actually have people who are physically telling you, and I'm, I know my parents have gone through it, which is why I now drop them off in person, I mailed it to you. And I mean, to get to anywhere in this community, it doesn't take three weeks. And yes, it, they do go to Ottawa. And even Van Kill mail no longer gets sorted in Van Kill. So is there something that we can do as our little part of the world to even get SDNG on board and say, listen, we have to address this? Who are you asking? 
<laughs> anybody. <laughs> well, maybe Councillor Manley can answer we've, that. We've dealt, <laughs> dealt with a, a Canada Post issue before at Lock Gary, um, and we we used our MP Francis Dura, and uh, he was quite helpful in that. He's got a connection. Got a connection there. So okay. That that might be the that might be the road to go because it is a it is a uh, it's, federal. it's federal. So uh, he was very helpful with with uh, sort, sorting out that problem. And, well, I'm so. having a conversation with him tomorrow, so maybe I'll ask. Okay, very good, Councillor Madden. Thank you. Uh, just following Councillor Massey's suggestion about the blue boxes, uh, we might be able to manage a trade in program pretty easily if they bring it in and give them a new one, and that way we can actually get them disposed of and set of them trying to get them picked up forever. <laughs> yes, uh, actually, Jessica is pretty amazing. And uh, if anybody brings their blue box to Rare, uh, she keeps a list of people who have taken a, a blue box. And if you, if you haven't been abusing the privilege uh, and it seems that it's just been damaged through, you know, uh, <clears throat> incidentals, then no we just swap. Yeah, we just swap it. If there's anything that's just uh, incidental damage, we just swap the blue box out. Um, it's a different matter if you want an extra one or something like that. But if you give us the broken one, we give you back the a good Could, one. Yep, the mail it calendar. Um, good, good idea. You could be sure that people don't know about that. Okay, um, I just have one question about some, we've been talking about having a, a conversation about the rare plant in general, general terms, because um, 2025 is still three years off. Is, is that coming? Yes, uh, it's it was a little bit more complicated than I thought, so it was going to be on Monday instead of today. Sure thing. That's great. I just wanted to know if it was if the conversation was coming. Okay, thank you very much for your report. That was very enlightening. If, if nobody has anything else, we're good. Thank you. Um, okay, so the you've heard the motion. Um, all in favor of the motion. Carried. Thank you. Uh, you, I guess you might as well stay up here because I think, oh no, you're doing the. Okay, thank you, Angela. Um, Joanne? Sorry. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Noble, that the Committee of the Whole receives staff report number PW 2022-08, the 2021 Alexandria Drinking Water System Annual and Summary Report for information purposes. Thank you, Councillor. Welcome. Deputy Mayor. Um, I do just want to say that there is a small typo on here. Um, I'm not just presenting the Alexandria drinking water system. I'm actually presenting both Alexandria and Glen Robertson. You should have also received reports for both Alexandria and Glen Robertson separately. Um, what I'll be presenting is just a brief overview, and I highly recommend that you read the full annual summary reports. So starting in Alexandria, I'll be going over a quick system description operational performances, critical control points, regulatory non-compliances or non-conformances, uh, water monitoring and testing, auditing inspections, and then impacting changes. So in the Alexandria system, it is a class three water treatment, class two distribution. We utilize raw surface water from the mill pond, and we have a rated capacity of 5,616 cubic meters per day. We are able to produce 8,014 cubic meters per day. And the system is made up of the water treatment plant, two elevated storage tanks, two separate distribution systems connected via transmission main, and four standby generators at all of our facilities to ensure that we've got operations throughout. Um, there's also the distribution system, which is comprised of 58.8 kilometers of piping, of various sizes and types isolation valves, pressure reducing valves, service connections, and fire hydrants. The chart below just gives you a basic summary of how it's split up throughout Alexandria, Maxwell, and along the transmission main. So for operational performances, 
in the raw water, we're only consuming about 30.4% of our raw intake capacity. We have an average daily flow of 1,707 cubic meters per day, with a maximum of 2,566 cubic meters. We've noted some issues on the intake where we've, we're getting sedimentation build up around our intake, which has limited some of our intakes. Uh, whenever we're pulling in water, we've had the area cleaned a few times over the last few years, and we are looking at a remediation plan, but obviously it's not as easy as going in and dredging. Um, we have to contact different levels of um, ministry and government to be able to do the work in the mill pond. We've noted um, some increased algae in the summer months between May and October. As such, we're part of the ministry sampling program. Our highest notes noted residuals occur in July and September. Now, although we have it occurring in our raw water, we're not seeing any issue in our treated water, which means our treatment system is working as designed. We have noted less um, process water throughout the treatment process since our upgrades. There have been no major incidences there have been some minor issues with process optimization and some minor issues with small equipment um, replacement. And there's been no major quality issues noted. The chart on the left is just, or on the right, sorry, is just a summary of our flows that we pull into the water treatment plant um, on a monthly basis throughout the year of 2021. On our treated water side, we are currently at about 19.1% of our rated capacity. Our average flow is about 1,548 cubic meters per day. Once again, we haven't seen any major incidents throughout 2021. Um, we had some minor issues with equipment failures, but for the most part, we had backups or spare parts available on site for repair and remediation. We've had some issues with communication failures, once again, caused by some small part issues. Um, but there was no process function that was actually lost and it all it triggered was manual operations of different facilities and different parts and pumps. There's been no noted major quality changes and there were no adverse water quality reports during this time. So in the distribution for our metered water Alexandria accounts for about 89% of our consumption, whereas Maxwell accounts for about 11%. We have a total annual metered just over 315,000 cubic meters per year. Uh, our construction summary, um, we did contract out all of our work, which was a COVID precaution. Uh, we had three water main breaks and two service repairs in 2021, which is down from what we would normally see. We do residual monitoring, which is mainly flushing. This is to ensure that we have quality and chlorine residuals out in the distribution as required. You'll see that in Alexandria, we flushed just over 13,000 cubic meters per this in 2021. In Maxwell, we flushed about 26, just over 26,000 cubic meters. Maxwell was a little bit higher, obviously, as a knee jerk reaction to the bow water advisory we had in 2020. We want to make sure that everything is operating. And because we didn't have the full system online yet, we wanted to make sure that our quality and our water usage was upheld. Um, the different programs that we run throughout the year, we have corrosion control, spring flushing, valve testing, fire hydrant maintenance, and infrastructure renewal. Um, let's skip to the next part. As part of our system, we do, as part of our quality management system, we look at different critical control points. So this is a basic quick summary on critical control where we, <clears throat> excuse me, these are points in the system where we know we can have issues that would impact the treatment quality and it's areas we can actually supply control. So in our sedimentation, we use our coagulant polymer dosing to ensure that we remove sedimentation. We only had one instance of dosing problems, which was caused by maintenance. It was caught mid process and corrected. So there was no issues in quality going out to the distribution. Disinfection, we apply chlorine gas. Dosing adjustments are basically due to visual observations or process observations. There's some noted instabilities throughout the years at different times due to seasonal fluctuations. Um, there's no process failures and most issues were resolved prior to sending out to the distribution. 
The next would be secondary residual boosting. Ask a question now. Okay, Angela. Yeah. Councillor Massey wants to ask. Mm -hmm. Just before we get too far, on the previous uh, graph you showed us, like I'm looking at the 2021 water loss. The uh, water loss. You know, the, the, the previous slide, yeah. So that, that's, some, in some instances, it's about 25% of our total water produced. Yep. So it's something we should be, I know this, we've been working hard at it, but it, that's a lot of water loss. So the water loss right now is based on um, our metering, um, what we know that we use. There are some areas we can kind of build up on. Um, there are some issues. We do have older infrastructure in Alexandria. Okay. So there are losses. We have started annual leak detection. Okay. Um, there's always going to be a little bit of yeah. loss somewhere. We are we have brought it down from where we were. Um, okay. Obviously, we target to be under 15%, but we're still just above that. Okay. Is that a like? I'm sure it's normal situation for older infrastructure, like yeah. our neighbors. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah that's fine. Go uh, ahead. Where was my rambling? Um, oops. Uh, so, oh yeah, so other critical control points. So the Maxwell booster, um, this is where we rechlorinate the water before it goes to the Maxwell water tower and then distribute it to the system. Um, you'll notice there's a small change in the trending on the chart after June 17th. This was a change to our trending and not a change to our process. It was just the way we were capturing the, uh, the, the numbers. Um, right now, there's no connection currently available on our transmission main, mainly because we only run the plant for about three hours, meaning the booster station. So it only runs for about three hours a day. And we need the pipe um, for blending and chlorine residuals. So right now, um, we basically have some chlorine degradation as it's coming into the booster, and then we boost it to higher than allowable in order to ensure that we get proper chlorine residuals up into Maxville to be able to distribute. Um, there's no real process failures. Um, and then chlorine monitoring residuals, the charts, so the second and third chart on the right hand side are our residuals at the water tower. So you can see that for the most part, they were well above one, which is where we would hope they would be. Um, there's a few points where they may have come a little bit lower than desired, but they were still all over our compliance, like they were higher than our compliance levels. So there's no issues that way. The next slide, this is just a basic summary of our sampling results, just to show you the amount of sampling that we do do annually. Um, there was no adverses apart from the sodium, which occurred in, I believe the first sample was in no, late, no, mid-November, and the second sample was mid-December. That has been since corrected. As of January, our sodium results were back to normal. Uh, we're still not 100% sure what caused the increase in sodium. Right now, it appears to be the raw water source, but we can't conclusively say this is what caused it. Um, there was nothing that changed in the system process, which is why we're looking more at the raw water, but it's hard to go back and prove that it's raw water. That's something that happened two months ago. Um, auditing and inspection. Um, so we are part of a DWQMS system. So the system maintenance is currently ongoing. Uh, we are a little lax on some of our requirements that we are trying to bring up to date. Uh, our main issues were internal auditing and um, the management review. So since this PowerPoint was made, um, our management review took place yesterday, so we are good there, and I'm in the process of preparing the internal audit, so we should be back up to snuff by hopefully the end of this month, beginning of March. Um, for compliance, we had our compliance inspection, so this is our ministry inspection. It was in November 26th. Oh, sorry, November 16th, 2021. We had a 92% risk rating, which is down from previous years. Most of our compliance issues were either from missed sampling, which were taken after the prescribed date, 
or it was an issue with trending and calibration. Uh, there was no orders imposed and there's a few best management practices that were given. So going forward are impacting changes. Um, so we did have new permits that were issued to us in 2021 in March. So all components have been rolled out into the processes and any change in the licensing requirements have been rolled out. There is a few new legislative acts coming in. So there's the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act. And this is more in regards to allowing and giving waterworks the force to get people boots on the ground um, in order, like in the event of long-term outages um, from COVID. There was the virtual training, which is now in place for operators. There were some minor changes to the skater reporting and then director notification that's to the ministry in regards to our licensing. There's a new water main disinfection, which we're, we're in the process of implementing all the new changes. They are looking at producing a new code of ethics for drinking water operators. Our PTTW, which is what allows us to pull water from the mill pond, that will be renewed in 2022. We're currently in the process of doing that application. And we obviously have an increase in costs and lag time for supplies due to COVID and manufacturing delays. And we luckily have a municipal election in October, which could impact obviously our direction as a township of a whole. So that's Alexandria. Questions, comments? Any questions? Go ahead, Councillor Mayor. Thank you, Angela. Uh, just to go back to the sodium incident, mm -hmm. is there anything that we can do to backtrack this to figure out what went on? I've got a couple ideas we can talk about later, but I'm just curious if uh, there's anything that you guys have thought of that we can actually do to figure out and make sure it doesn't happen again. So right now, I would say that it would be hard to go back and prove because we don't have the sampling data yeah. to kind of back it up. Historically, we're around like 10 to 15 milligrams per liter. Yeah. Um, there's only been one other spike, which was in 2015. So I'm not really sure what's causing the spikes. It wasn't the same time of year. It was, I want to say June, but I could be wrong. Okay, thank you for that report. We'll uh, we'll vote on that on the motion that was read earlier uh, for the Alexandria Water Drinking System. All in favor of the motion, carried. Thank you. So, uh, Councillor Noble, if you can put the next motion on the table, please. By myself, seconded by Councillor Massey, that the Committee of the Whole receive staff report. Number PW 2022-09, Annual Wastewater Reports for Alexandria and Maxville for information purposes. Oh, okay, we're not there yet. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, I'm we're sorry. I thought we were uh, Sorry, yeah, there's a, there was the a typo one. in the minutes. Okay. It shouldn't just be Alexandria. It should actually be the drinking water system, and that uh, might have been my problem, my fault. No, 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 that's fine. <laughs> that, that's just fine. Ca carry on and... Um, so, no. <laughs> uh, Glenn Robertson... So basically, this is going to be kind of the same format, being kind of fast tracked through some of the items that would be the same as Alexandria. So Glenn Robertson. Once again, Sorry, Brenda. the same format where we've got system description, we'll go over the operational performance, critical, uh, critical control points, regulatory nonconformance, um, and adverse testing, the auditing and impacting changes are the same as Alexandria. So Glen Robertson is a small municipal residential system with a class one distribution and supply designation. We use groundwater source water and we have the ability to, to take 224 cubic meters per day. This system is designated as goody, which means groundwater under the direct influence of surface water. The system is made up of the Glen Robertson pump house treatment facility. Um, there's no distribution storage and there's one standby generator at the pump house. We do have monitoring about at the midpoint at the church. 
So the distribution is composed of 0.8 kilometers of water pipes, varying sizes, isolation valves, pressure, nope, not pressure reducing valves. And there's, I do apologize, there's typos in here. There's no fire hydrants. Um, and then the chart below summarizes it. So we do have three flushing ports, three isolation valves, and only about 50 service connections. So the operational performance. So for the treated water, we're only at, at about 11% of the raw intake capacity. We have an average flow of 24.9 cubic meters per day. We have some minor sedimentation issues, which is more seasonal. Uh, we have one major incidence where we had the well pump malfunction. It was actually parts in the well pump panel. It was replaced. There was a boil water issued um, and then resolved, I believe, within two days of the initial response. Although the well pump was up, the boil water took about two days to resolve once we got our sampling results and everything back. We had uh, minor incidences of equipment failure and part replacement. Um, most issues were resolved with backup equipment until the parts could be either obtained or replaced. There's no major quality issues in Glen Robertson. Um, in the distribution, so this year, 2021, rather, we metered about 6,873 cubic meters. We only had one service repair, and once again, all work was subcontracted out. Our residual monitoring and flushing, we used about 21.6 cubic meters, which was mostly due to low residual alarms and preventative flushing at the actual pump house itself. So our critical control points in Glen Robertson. Oops, let me skip. Um, well, that once again is that summary. The critical control points uh, are our disinfection, which is UV treatment and sodium hypochlorite dosing. We didn't have any operational issues. We had one instance of delayed startup, but the unit was in standby until it was ready to be put in service. The sodium hypo, once again, the dosing is based on observed process. And we do have some minor issues with equipment failure and pump failure which we are working with the manufacturer to try and resolve. We do have a backup, so there is no issue of um, if the pump fails, what happens then? We always have a backup system to ensure that we don't lose our treatment possibility. In the distribution, um, we do have monitoring at the midpoint. There's no issues noted or no degradation noted in the distribution. Once again, this is the sampling results. So. Similar to Alexandria, we do have a fair amount of testing that gets done annually. Um, there were no adverse tests, even after the well pump failure and our sampling, everything came back good. Um, so this is the summary for audit. So the QMS is basically in the same shape because Alexandria and Glen Robertson share the same QMS, although the MECP compliance inspection is slightly different. So we had our last inspection September 28th. We had a 96% risk rating. Um, once again, most of the issues were in regards to some minor issues. Um, one is the UV monitoring. So we don't have that trended on an ongoing basis as prescribed. We were supposed to bring SCADA in, which would have resolved this. This is still an ongoing matter. It's just been delayed due to COVID. Um, director notification is just a minor clarification clerical issue that has been resolved since. And then we have monitoring walls on the site where we had to replace the covers to prevent infiltration or other issues that could enter into the well. We had no orders and the best management practices that were issued was system pressure monitoring and treatment bypass measures. Impact and changes is the same. And that is it for the water summaries. So that's um, <clears throat> Madam Clerk, do we have to uh, adjust the the motion because it didn't it didn't include Glenn Robertson or is it fine as is? Uh, through Mr. Def Deputy Mayor, yes, you should change the motion, please. To okay. Accept both. Okay. So, um, uh, Councillor 
I, I think it was you, Joanne, that, if you could please add to your motion, Glenn Robertson. And reread it, please. And we'll vote on it. Please. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Noble, that the Committee of the Whole receive staff report number PW 2022-08, the 2021 Alexandria and Glen Robertson Drinking Water System Annual and Summary Reports for information purposes. Okay, thank you. Uh, all in favor of the motion? Carried. So please go ahead. Um, we've already had the, so the annual wastewater reports for Alexandria Maxville is fine as it is then. It's already been read. So go ahead with your report and we'll vote on it afterwards. So there is no presentation for this one. It's just, um, the, we're just providing you with the annual reports, which you should have received a copy for both Alexandria and Maxwell. Okay. And it's just as um, proof of delivery. Right, so. okay. So um, do, do councillors have any uh, questions for Angela on the report? Go ahead, Councillor. I thought we were going to have the whole uh, presentation presented, <laughs> but that's okay. I can read it tonight. <laughs> but I thought you already read it. <laughs> reread it. <laughs> I have one question: uh, the capacity um, at, at the lagoons. Mm -hmm. um, what numbers are we at for Alexandria and Maxville, please? Off the top of my head, I can't remember. I believe it's around 79%. It's in the report. It's actually, well, it's further down, but it's also further up. Uh, up. I believe, no, up. Sorry, the other way. Should be <clears throat> 76. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, 76 is what it is. Yeah, no, you it was the 76 that you that you showed earlier. Uh yeah, so Maxwell would be in the Maxwell one. So 76 for Alexandria? 76 for Alexandria and then you're 72 for Maxwell. Okay, very good. That's helpful. Thank you. Okay, are there, yes, go ahead, Councilman. Angela, just the quick question about the sludge in the lagoons in Alexandria. Mm -hmm. uh, anything significant or special that needs to be done there? We're just going to keep going with sort of geotubes until? I believe the plan is to continue with the geotubes to try to get the sludge in cell B down. Um, and then once we get obviously the capital works going, we'll have to kind of reevaluate when we get there at that point because it's part of the pro like part of the issues that has to be resolved prior to construction. So, any other questions? Um, we've already voted on the motion. Thank you, Angela, for your report. Hmm? Sorry, I was thinking of the other one. All in favor of the motion. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. And number four, engineering investigation work plan and low cost bituminous roads. Uh, Councillor Massey, please put the motion on the table. And welcome, Tim. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Noble, that the Committee of the Whole recommends to Council that the 2022 road work as presented in Table A be approved. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, so this report is about modifying our work plan from what was outlined in the roads need study uh, to a more, spec a more specific work plan, uh, especially based on a few concerns that I have with uh, the performance, the historical performance of some of the roads. So I started, when I started here, I started interviewing the uh, workers at the different uh, garages um, and trying to get, actually that was a recommendation from the roads need study, was that 
uh, we should try and interview these guys and get a little bit more information. So we did that. And what became apparent very quickly was that uh, a certain type of road was not standing up to uh, the performance that it should. It wasn't living out its life cycle. So if you go through the report, uh, I outline the difference between uh, bitumen and asphalt and uh, LCB and HCB roads. So LCB stands for uh, low class bituminous and HCB stands for high class bituminous. So to give a bit of a summary, bitumen is the uh, material which binds uh, asphalt together. Um, so if you think of uh, concrete, the difference between cement and concrete is cement is like a, a it's almost like grout, it's what binds the, the concrete together. And when you combine the cement with the aggregate, and when you combine the bitumen with the aggregate, that actually becomes uh, asphalt concrete or concrete in the case of concrete. Um, so a, uh, I thought it was really important to point that out just because there is so much confusion with uh, the naming conventions uh, across the world and across Canada and within municipalities and within engineering departments, people can refer to it as different things. Um, one term that everybody uses, and if you're talking to people in the asphalt industry that I recommend that you use is uh, asphalt concrete. Um, that's an engineering term and everybody uses that the same. And if uh, it's scroll down a little bit on that report for me. Thank you, sir. Um, that there is asphalt concrete. So it's, it's prepared in a uh, bitumen plant or an asphalt plant and shipped to site. Uh, that, that truck up the front is then pouring it into the, into the paver and then they lay that down uh, as a, a composite material that has a structural component to it. Uh, and that's the real, really the main difference that you're gonna see between the asphalt concrete and uh, low class bituminous roads, um, which have a variety of names, including chip seal, is that those don't have any structural integrity to them. Everything that they have structural about them is provided by the base and the sub base. Uh, so, my main concerns is that those low class bituminous roads um, and we've got there's two types low class bituminous roads and high class bituminous roads lcb and hcb the those are the common terms used in uh the the counties like the um, stng um, and basically a hcb road is built with some sort of asphalt concrete uh, so you can have different types, you can have cold in place, you can have different recipes that do different things depending on your geotechnical conditions, depending on what purpose the road serves. Um, and uh, I just thought it was important to, to spell those out so that everybody understands that I, you know, everyone's using the same um, terminology. Um, so the problem I've detected is that the roads, um, specifically Kenyon Concession 8, Dorney, McCormick, Marku, Kenyon Concession 1, uh, Kenyon Concession 15, Indian Lands, and Kenyon Concession 16, Indian Lands, uh, Hope We Met, and Brattle, uh, Brattlebane Road. I'm sorry if I'm mangling any of these names. <laughs> um, I'll get it, I promise. But uh, all of these roads, seem to have failed before their service life ends. So within five years, they have fractured, uh, cracked and failed. And uh, it's very expensive to, to go and, and redo these. Uh, so a lot of these roads were set. Um, I think it's down at the, uh, sorry, at the bottom of that report, I don't have it in front of me, but mm -hmm. in, the, in the roads need study, um, a lot of these roads were set to be um, LCB'd again. So we were going to pulverize and double surface treat them, treatment them. So, uh, and again, terminology, we were basically going to take that LCB road and turn it again into an LCB road. So renew it. Um, and 
uh, pulverized and double surface treatment is pretty much the, the highest, uh, it's basically redoing the entire road. You don't need to do a little bit of base, but the cost is pretty big compared to doing, if, if you had a green road and you were gonna upgrade it to a, um, an LCB road, you go and place the base and then you do a double surface treatment. And this is pulverizing the existing double surface treatment and putting it back down and doing some spot treatment for the base there as well. So it's very expensive. And uh, what I want to do, like what I think the way forward is, is to really go and do some geotechnical investigation. Uh, it's, it's too early for me to say exactly why those uh, roads failed. And uh, believe me, I have my theories, but uh, I really think that we need to do the proper investigations and this is also what is recommended in the um, in the roads need study as well. But the roads need study scope was just to say this is what we've got, and this is our maintenance schedule if we're going to maintain what we've got. So it was really to, to sort of head off the question of why didn't the roads need study? Why is the roads need study saying that we should redo these roads uh, when I think there should be more investigation? It's just because it was beyond their scope. Um, so you can see a, a, a photo there of uh, a borehole. Um, I think that one in particular was actually uh, from uh, Trans-Canadian Highway um, when, when they were having issues with sinkholes. And uh, basically they're about a meter and a half in depth and it should give us an idea of what the sub base is there. Um, because if we, have, if we have a bad sub base and it also gives us the consistency of our road, uh, then it doesn't really matter what we do on top of it. We need to uh, we need to perform some dig outs and repair that sub base before we keep on going. Um, yeah, so unfortunately, I don't have really any big answers here. Um, this is a significant problem um, that's that's throughout our road network. So there is quite a bit of gravity to this. But really the way forward is to go and investigate, see what we're really dealing with. And uh, then hopefully we can make some good decisions on uh, how to work on these roads in the future. What you will notice is that uh, when we take these roads out of the equation um, to go and do uh, engineering instead, how I've allocated it is those roads that were LCB and were going to be done this year, what I'm saying is that instead of that, we'll go and do investigations, inv engineering investigations on those roads and the ones that were going to be done next year. Uh, so they're done ahead of time. And then with the rest of the funds, I've just taken the next HCB roads on the, uh, on the roads need study and bump them up. So we had those, uh, if you remember, we had the, the green and the blue sections, the ones that were, were optional and they very, very much strongly recommended that we did them. We just took the next roads in line as per the study and bumped them up there. Uh, so they are uh, West Boundary Road, Bishop Street, and Nick Street, uh, Nixon Boundary Road, Hugh Monroe Street, Kennedy Avenue. Um, we did some further investigation and found that Sandfield Avenue is actually okay how it is, but does need a good crack ceiling. Um, they recommended a pulverizing pave. Uh, we did another investigation with the county's guys and talked to um, the engineer there as well. Um, we had a, a phone call with him just to double check. And he said, yeah, this would be fine. You could extend that life by crack ceiling instead, which gives us some more funds to play with. Um, and uh, unfortunately, Power Dam Road as well. Um, now that was a LCB road that was upgraded to uh, HCB. And unfortunately, those treatments that were picked uh, were not the best for that situation. It, it, again, it is an LCB road, and we tried to upgrade it to uh, HCB, but we didn't do geotechnical investigations beforehand. So uh, we should just go and crack seal that road. Luckily that now, because we've done it, Asphalt is the most recycled material in the world. Uh, now that that material is down there, it's still an asset and we should just crack seal it. Unfortunately, it's not the prettiest with the crack in it, but when it comes time to pulverize and pave it again, there's good material there now. So we can, we can keep on going. Um, 
that is pretty much it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Just Tim on Sandfield Street. Can you just make sure? I know we're going to do crack ceiling, but uh, yep. as you're as you're coming down from um, the old Alexander Molding and Sabrins, there is a dip uh, that we've gotten lots of complaints about. So if you can check that and just make sure it's uh, while we're doing it. Okay, Councillor Manley. Yeah. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, Tim, I think I think. This, this plan going forward is, is, is what we need to do. I mean, this, this makes sense. I know we look at what we did last year on our Dam road and there are huge cracks going down that road. That's after one year, well, less than a year, not even a year, it was July that we did that. So, I mean, we've, we've got to know what we're putting, you know, what, what's underneath there so that we, we do this right. So uh, congratulations on, on doing that because I think this, this, is, this is the way forward for us um definitely to do that quick question about nick is it nixon yep it's right on our boundary is that is it a boundary road or is it i i don't know if it's a boundary road or not but uh the reason why that one's in there is that it's in a in a place that is near the 417 and uh the drainage there will not work unless that road is in good condition it's a very small section yeah um well it go, does it go into a green road uh, change into a green. I was looking at the. Yeah. Okay, so we're we're just looking at that little section, and then. Yeah. It's just a small section there. If we we need to repair that because it's, uh, and that's why it was picked on the roads need study. Yeah. Uh, because if we don't, we can't uh, we can't say return that one to gravel or or right. anything like that. We need a if that's not a hard surface, it won't work very well with our drainage. Okay. Yeah, so, makes sense. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, other questions? Yes, go ahead, Councillor. Just Noble. a quick comment. Again, um, with the <clears throat> pictures, like Joanne said, it just makes sense. So I appreciate breaking it down because we're just like, oh, yeah, we know what surface treatment is and we know what it all does. Yeah, we will. But now we have an exact, like, just description, like, and using all the different terms because, yeah, everybody uses something different. So thank you. There is. Go ahead. After you. Um, yeah, I. This is a, a lot of engineers have this problem that they assume a lot of people in the room know what they're talking about, but often other engineers in the same room won't know what they're talking about because they're using a different set of acronyms. Uh, so thank you. Sorry. Okay. Anybody with any other comments or questions? I, I have a, a quick one. Just with regards to the some of the like i'm going to use the fourth concession as an example uh which has is as you pointed out falling apart previous to that when it was first surface treated from gravel because this is the second time that road lasted a long time a long long time and so it, so it doesn't make sense why some of these roads that were initially done year like i'm th I'm, I'm thinking like 15 years ago, or, or, or even longer, because it was, yeah, longer ago than that. And, and the road really lasted, and it was a double surface treatment. So it may not just be what's under the ground that's the problem. You know, it could, it could easily be the, the product or, or the, the way it's being applied. Like we may be getting an inferior product that's applied badly. And, and so, it, I'm not sure we should be too quick to abandon the double surface treatment. If we can get a good product and get it properly laid on a, on a proper surface, it, 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 it has been very economical and effective in the past. It's just recently that it hasn't been. Uh, through you, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor. Yes. Um, so uh, you are absolutely correct. So LCB has, absolutely has its place inside a road network um, and you can get different formulas that are uh, flexible so it won't provide any structural stability but as the traffic moves along it it will flex underneath it um, but it really it really comes back to the importance of engineering and, and knowing what you're doing uh, having the the previous work done by uh, Sarah and Michelle and Tara and the previous public works directors 
has, I wouldn't have been able to come to this uh, report if I hadn't had that previous information uh, going and, and finding these guys uh, and, and getting when we put down LCB roads that proved for, for 2022 are really going to help because we need to know where the traffic is, uh, what the conditions are underneath the road, what sort of, and the recipes that you can use to put down an LCB road are enormous. There's, there's a huge range um, and Sometimes they can be, sometimes it's not even a matter of quality control, it's almost terminology. He said, I want a chip seal road, and he said, I want a surface treatment road, and that meant two different things to two different people. Uh, so yeah, you're absolutely right. And I, I have my theories of why some of these roads have failed, but um, until we do the engineering, I can't really Let's say like, definitively. Thank you very much. It's yeah. Much appreciated and like everyone said, an excellent report. Okay, last comment and then we've got to move on. We've got to get to our next. No, no, no. no. Thank you very much for your report. Thank you. Um, okay, so you've heard the motion. Um, did you put the motion on the table? Okay, all in favor of the motion? Carried, thank you. Um, we have next the fire department, departmental work plan update. Um, Councillor Massey. No? Okay, yeah. Councillor Noble. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Moved by myself, self seconded by Councillor Manley, that the Committee of the Whole re receives report F22 from the Fire Department for information purposes only. Great. Go ahead, Matthew. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, just some quick updates on a few items. So, our communication system uh, is still ongoing with some delays in some equipment due to the uh, due to COVID. However, um, we did receive some uh, new portable radios for the roads department. So each one of their members is going to have a portable radio that's going to be linked into our uh, communication system across the township. So they'll have access to uh, township wide communication for uh, internally. And should there be any emergency situation, we'll be able to all communicate uh, effectively. So this will also include the emergency operations center here. Uh, so we'll have uh, proper radio communications throughout uh, all the departments uh, throughout uh, our township. In terms of fire permits, uh, currently agricultural permits, um, we've issued 15 so far, but currently there's uh, zero um, currently approved right now. Brush permits, we have 79 and recreational uh, 90. So we typically see an increase as the year goes on and, or whenever um, residents uh, require them. In terms of our training, we've resumed our training as of uh, February 7th uh, after suspending due to COVID to ensure that uh, we can remain operational in some, and due to uh, some of the uh, restrictions. Uh, regular training meetings, uh, just an outline um, of some of the training that we're gonna be focusing on, uh, medical response and fire behavior, as well as our uh, yearly uh, first aid CPR uh, that's gonna be um, going on. We've recently enrolled some of our members in some um, Ontario Fire College courses, which include fire inspection and uh, incident uh, safety officer, as well as hazardous material awareness. Recently, just an update uh, from the province in terms of firefighter certification. Uh, the Office of the Fire Marshal recently uh, provided an update regarding uh, firefighter certification. Currently, there is no uh, standard for firefighter certification under the Fire Prevention and Protection Act in Ontario. So OFM has developed a proposed regulation just currently under the FPPA, which would introduce a mandatory minimum requirement. The proposed approach is based, is gonna be based on specific job requirements um, and competencies uh, through, the, um, through the National Fire Protection and uh, Association standards. So currently the regulation is in consultation draft and is posted for comment up until uh, February 28th. Um, currently OFM has um, have held meetings with stakeholders, including fire chiefs across the province, 
uh, where they've had town halls and uh, Q and A sessions. The new uh, proposed regulations will have some impacts on our department, impact in our current and um, new recruits. Our department remains in a good standing order in terms of being able to meet these requirements. Um, however, you know, with the assist with our new train facility, we'll be able to really move forward and uh, continue to move forward, ensuring that. However, the proposed regulation goes, whether there's any changes once um, it comes into effect. We anticipate uh, a final draft in July 2022, which will see a, um, a transition period of, of four years to get fully certified and six years for certain certifications. Um, I'll be providing a report for, uh, in, uh, most likely in March to outline where we're going to be going in terms of even just to give an outline of all the certification that's required for us uh, as a fire department. In terms of um, recruitment, uh, we've just announced a uh, recruitment drive for 2022, and we'll be forecasting hopefully 10 to 12 new recruits, and um, hopefully we'll be um, course loading them in the month of May or June. Fire prevention, we continue to conduct inspections um, as outlined in our uh, ENR. Um, as well as we'll be conducting a door-to-door -door, um, smoke detector campaign that's gonna be announced uh, through social media and so forth, which will align uh, with our uh, recruitment drive. We've also, uh, we'll be adding some fire inspectors to our uh, fire prevention division. This will be uh, within each station to assist the senior fire prevention officer uh, conduct uh, inspections throughout the, the township. In terms of our fleet, We've recently implemented a new uh, vehicle and equipment inspection uh, system called Check It for our apparatus. This is an online uh, system that's implemented for uh, provides uh, inspections, required inspections, weekly inspections, as well as inventories, all our, our assets, uh, tracking, um, maintenance, as well as any fuel. So we'll be able to, to visualize and see at a year end report providing where um, the required fleet and how much increase in vehicles and so forth and which fleet we need to address uh, specific items. So uh, it'll be a great uh, tool moving forward. Uh, that pretty much concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you for your report. Any questions, comments from anyone? No? Okay, uh, you've heard the motion. All in favor of the motion? Carried. Thank you, Matthew. Um, we have in other business, we, uh, Councillor Noble has requested uh, to address to talk about the a zoom vote. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> I just wondered what we have to do what we have to do officially to allow us to vote while we're attending the meetings because like if it was last night I wouldn't have come. Um, so obviously I can watch and I guess I could just text in a vote but like what do we have to do to make those things legal. Yes, please go ahead. So through you, Mr. Ms. Stephanie Mayor. Um, so Councillor Noble, we have to change the procedural bylaw to allow um, electronic voting. So what you're suggesting is that, you know, if you hadn't been able to attend, that we would put you somehow up on the screen and that you'd be able to vote here at the council table. So there's two different options. There's one where you can have a procedural bylaw change where the councillor can view from home, but not have voting rights. And then the second option is to allow them to be able to vote from afar. Um, we haven't brought that change to Council because we haven't been requested as staff to do so, so that's why I wanted you to bring it up today for Council to sort of discuss and then we can certainly bring back a change for, for the procedure by the way, I have some other administrative things I'd like to change as well. Um, that I can bring at the same time it's just you don't like to bring your procedure by law too often um, usually a couple of times during the term so. Yeah, just so we you can vote, you can count, and your attendance counted. You were there, mm -hmm. whether you're sunny south or stuck at home. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> to uh, at a council meeting because I'm I'm utterly opposed to it. I think you need to be at a meeting, and uh, I think it'll be just become an excuse on a night where. Maybe the roads are bad, maybe they aren't, that you're not going to be here. I think if we're having in-person meetings, we have in-person meetings. If we have a night like last night, we would have canceled the meeting, obviously. So 
Um, I, I, I don't I don't like that idea. I don't think it's uh, you know if, uh, I'm sitting in uh, Mexico and I'm come on and you know I, I just don't think it's proper. I think that you should be here at the meeting and uh, but again that's just my opinion. If uh, all members of council want a different way, I just look at we've done this now for. Uh, since amalgamation since 98 and we haven't had those kind of issues i know we're moving forward in a different kind of world but i i just don't see it councillor Winsing, right right i agree with a lot of what you're saying however there's circumstances where maybe you can't leave your home because you might be a caregiver there might be extenuating circumstances that the flexibility to allow someone to attend from home through zoom and be able to vote i think is a good option and maybe there's just parameters around how we allow that to happen. Um, can, I, can I make a suggestion? Um, that I think um, the, our mayor's uh, suggestion of bringing it to council with a report mm -hmm. so that we can formally you know, debate the issue because uh, I, I, I know that at county's council, uh, Councillor Jaworski um, wasn't able, she, she wasn't able to be at the meeting because she had other business she had to take care of. So she needed to be in front of her screen and go back and forth um, at home. And so she was allowed to attend the meeting. That was, it's not written in, into the procedural bylaw there, but she did request, it was a formal request to, to have that happen. Otherwise she wouldn't have been able to participate. So I think there are pluses and minuses. And, and so if, go ahead. Yeah, no, I think because like, I have no issue making it like twice a year or something just you know, so you don't just every Saturday or every Monday just yeah I don't I don't feel like going just yeah. I seriously can't get there I seriously you know because obviously we have snowstorms that don't happen here um, two roads apart there so there are certain certain things that I think yeah if you make it just it has to be a really good reason or it has to be only twice a year or I mean does our attendance even count you know what I mean like if you miss forty meetings obviously it's a problem but. If, if you, you miss, miss two you or miss three, more than two in a row, uh, the third one you can you can be removed from council. Right, right. So, so I think there has again, to be a just, backup for that. Just to that point, I mean, I know we can keep talking about this, but let's get a report yeah. from and have a full uh, a full debate at council. I sure. think that's uh, what we should be. Okay, thank you. Uh, if everyone's okay, we will. Uh, we will skip matters arising from standing committees uh, due to time constraints. We need to get on with the other meeting. Um, so if that's all right with everybody, then uh, we don't have any notice of motion. Um, Councillor Manley, if you would please adjourn the meeting. Deputy Mayor, uh, move on myself, second by Councillor Madden. There'll be no further business discussed. The meeting was adjourned at 4.53 p.m. Okay, everyone's heard the motion. Uh, all in favor. Okay, carried. So thank you. I'll pass the chair back over to the mayor and um, we'll move into the, uh, the special meeting. Not you, we're not <laughs> we're not using our microphones enough, and also for all of staff, uh, it makes no sense for if we're gonna if it's all about transparency. Please get up and go to the microphone until you know such time that we move to the new place and everybody has a microphone. Uh, just because we can't hear anything you're saying uh, unless you're at a microphone, so um, it's just very confusing listening to it on the way here and. Uh, you don't really know what the, the flow of the meeting that's happening just for people out there. Just for those people that you know that want to have meetings at home. So <laughs> just kidding. Okay, I'll call the meeting to order. Are there any declarations of pecuniary interest or the general nature thereof? Seeing none, I have a motion moved by Deputy Mayor Williams, seconded by Councillor Massey that the Council of the Township of North Glengarry accepts the agenda of the special meeting of council on Wednesday, February 23rd, 2022. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion? Motion is carried. Uh, and we will move right on to delegations, IHA Canada, presented by Will Ball and Steve Greason. Welcome, Will. Thank you, everybody. 
Uh, first off, uh, I'm going to have to apologize for Steve. It's funny that we brought up uh, the weather. Uh, Steve got stuck in at his house with the ice storm and he wasn't able to make it today. He is on the call on the council virtually. So come the question period, I think we're going to be able to bring Steve in to answer questions as well. So, um, okay. So I guess this is the same. Okay. Well, uh, as, uh, as the mayor said, uh, my name is Will Ball. I'm the CEO of IHA Canada, and I've been one of the founders uh, from the early stages of this project. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to present to everybody. I think I've had a chance to meet most of you in the past, but I, I do see a couple of new faces. How you doing? <laughs> um, this has been quite a journey. Um, you know, I was reflecting on this as I was putting together this presentation and you know, personally, I started working on this project more than three years ago when it was an idea. And uh, I was pretty thankful that North Glengarry took us up on exploring that idea in um, a lot more detail now at this point. So uh, I also want to thank uh, a couple of folks in this room, uh, specifically Jacob and Sarah, who have been a really helpful and masterful uh, part of bringing this to um, a point of actually being able to present this to council. So, so thanks to them as well. <clears throat> and I'll get right into it. Um, this is our mission statement. So I'll read it out for most of the folks that haven't seen it. Uh, at IHA Canada, we provide innovative, independent and progressive care lifestyle living with a fully integrated campus of care support and services for seniors. Uh, we do this by providing affordable rental accommodations with a safe and sustainable village setting supported by optional high quality and fully integrated senior center health senior centered health care home care and wellness related support services and activities. That's a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> but essentially, the theme of it is providing affordable accommodations for folks with a variety of needs that allow them to adapt the care that they receive within the dwelling that they live in without having to move. So that's really what our goal was from the start and, uh, and what I think we've, uh, we've accomplished with, um, with what I'm about to present. So if you look at this slide here, this is an excerpt from the architectural site plan. I don't know how well you can actually see that on the screen. Um, but it's located on the vacant land directly north of the hospital. And if you notice here, phase like this. Along the eastern border of, uh, of the site, specifically right as Touchette Street turns into industrial, that is the initial uh, connection into, into the local streets. I'll zoom in on the next slide to see it a little bit better. So this is an image of phase one. Uh, it's just a zoomed up version of the last slide we were looking at. Uh, you'll see we've taken a bit of a different approach to housing development <clears throat> and just setting up housing in general. Uh, what we've really focused on was de-emphasizing the, the vehicle at, in a traditional housing space by creating parking lots, as you see here, and really taking the, the dwelling, the house, and making that the central focus of the living space. So there's a couple of positives that come out of that. Number one, uh, by removing the need to have a vehicle directly adjacent to every dwelling, uh, we are able to create smaller, tighter spaces that encourage a sense, a strong sense of community between adjacent neighbors because the roadways don't need to be as big. And what we really wanted to foster was a, the concept of what we call pocket neighborhoods. And I know I've, I've preached this to this council before, um, but what it really means is by getting rid of that vehicle and putting it off to the side, you end up having small parkettes and a lot more green space within your actual living vicinity 
and putting the, the vehicle not far. I mean, in our case, I think the furthest vehicle is about 50 meters away from the furthest dwelling. So it's not far, but it just gets it a little bit far enough away that you really focus on garden space, green space, and trees within the immediate vicinity of your living space. Um, within phase one and phase two, uh, we have a mixture of units um, ranging from single detached houses, semi-detached, as well as deluxe and standard row units. The, ra the rationale for that is, again, trying to really serve a variety of individuals and people at different socio socioeconomic levels uh, from people that want that larger space or maybe they're a couple so they need a larger space um, right down to somebody who is much more budget conscious maybe they're an individual so they don't need as much space or they have mobility issues that having a larger space to clean becomes cumbersome so that is why we we, we did this uh, this range uh, of housing units, but what we also wanted to avoid was having areas where. All the singles are in one location and then all the row housing is in another location, because now you create a scenario where you have areas where maybe you have the haves and you have areas where the, there's the have not so the people that aren't as fortunate. So in the site planning process, we really, and I'll give our architects a lot of credit because they, they didn't like me much during this process, but uh, we really pushed hard to create mixtures in every area of this development, both phase one and two of, you know, you might have a standard row house right next to a single. And we think that makes for a much more vibrant community within, uh, within our development. Go yeah, ahead. please. Uh, I'd just like to go back to parking for a second. Yep. Uh, I completely understand, you know, the idea behind creating a walkable community focused mm -hmm. on uh, a natural environment and, 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 and a, you know, bringing people together. Uh, but it, it's a seniors development, you know, designed for people who are aging. And in some cases, as you pointed out, we'll have mobility issues. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know, but walking from some of those units to the parking area for somebody with mobility issues, it, 50 meters is a long way. For sure. So first off, I'll address that by in, in site planning, we actually consulted with some of our healthcare partners to set those parameters on what is it? Because the question we essentially asked ourselves is exactly what you brought up. Hey, we want to decentralize the car and, and but how far is too far, I guess, is ultimately the question we were trying to answer. And that number seemed to keep creeping up. Now, with that said, um, we've also strategized and I'll, and I'll talk about um, barrier free units in a moment. Um, but the way we're structuring this is the barrier free units i.e. typically for somebody with more mobility issues are the ones that are actually going to be closer to the parking lots. So the, the way we've strategized the actual and we're going to sort this out in, in detail during the building permitting, but the units closest to the parking lot are going to be the ones that are designed as barrier free. So to address the, exactly the point you brought up that strategically those ones will be earmarked for individuals with, with higher mobility issues. It's not perfect, you know, obviously some, you know, the one, the unit right next to the uh, parking lot is going to be a little bit better than the one, two units down. But as a general strategy, we've earmarked the closest units to be the ones to serve people with the highest needs. Okay, so phase two. Uh, you'll look here is, is located. Yeah, go ahead. Just, uh, hold on. Sorry, oh, yeah. just oh, while, while you're talking about oh, yeah, that. Please. Um, I'm looking and I'm zooming it in as much as I can. Um, so say for the houses that are up top, I see there's a parking lot here and there's a parking lot there. If I'm delivering a chair or something, is the car able to pull up to any of those houses? 
No, if there's, okay. if there's a chair being done, they're, they're going to have to be walked in the same way that you'd have to do if you lived in an apartment building or something like that. You okay. get it as, as close as possible and then and then it'll have to be shepherded in. The rest okay, of the way. no, I'm just thinking big grocery day or all that kind of stuff. You're never going to be able to pull up your car. No, to your, okay. again, because, you know, there's also a factor that if you're able to pull up your car, then people will, right? So um, in order to keep those pathways walkable, we want to make sure people don't take their cars right up. And they're not really designed for regular traffic use. Now, again, with that said, um, we are working on a couple of programs that we are looking to integrate into our service delivery that will address things like that, like carrying groceries from your car for somebody that isn't able to do that, but I, that hasn't been considered in the, in the site planning process. Okay, and I'm also thinking like ambulance and all that kind of stuff. So the ambulance it meets all the requirements for Ontario Building Code as far as getting close enough that the paramedics can can walk can bring the uh, a stretcher, for instance, uh, in, into the unit. Right, not the 50 meters though. Like they could pull up some way to. They can get fairly close. I know some of our guys are creative, but yeah, yeah. Now the the, the pathways are have actually geotechnically been designed that they can be driven on. So, in, in an emergency, okay. yes, so you you would be able to drive on them. But as a general rule, we don't want people people driving on the walking paths. Okay, so you're looking at phase two uh, here. It's it's quite a similar type of layout to phase one. Um, there's a uh, a few more singles, and if you notice along the eastern or, or left side of the, of the drawing here. Um, those are all the single units and they will actually be the ones that will have driveways with covered parking. So there are some on like ones that front onto the street and it's specifically the singles, but I'll show you an image of it later in this presentation that will make that clear. Okay. So some key stats uh, for our project. Um, what we're proposing as part of this current site plan application is the first two of a 10 phase development. Um, the reason we're doing it in phases is well, a variety of reasons. Um, it's prudent financially to not try to build 700 houses <laughs> in one shot. Um, and we want, but, but additionally, we want to be able to evaluate whether the assumptions that we made for housing type and housing mix are accurate. You know, we, we've done some demographic research. We have a pretty good sense that we've got it right. However, we're really not going to know until folks start moving in and start telling us all the things we did wrong and, <laughs> um, and really reevaluate what we're going to do for subsequent phases. So from a company strategy standpoint, it actually made a lot more sense to start with two, prove that we can do it and that, you know, really walk before we can run. And then we'll have a lot more data to be able to pull on from subsequent phases to be able to design phase three and beyond. Uh, phase one consists of 57 units, uh, five singles, 16 semis, 18 deluxe row homes and 18 standard row homes. Uh, phase two, uh, 52 units uh, that are eight singles, 14 semis, 24 deluxe rows and 16 standard rows. So as you can see, um, like I was saying before, we really did focus on trying to put together quite an even distribution of unit types uh, to be able to serve all, uh, all demographic types. Um, Building timing, uh, we're anticipating building permitting to take approximately four to five months on the completion after the completion of the site plan approval, uh, which gets us beginning construction in the third quarter of this year, give or take. Um, Jacob's kicking me under the table over here, but <laughs> but that's that's the timing we're looking at. So we we plan on building this summer. Uh, we have all our financing in place to be able to do it. Um, but the last stage, uh, once once we do uh, achieve site plan approval, is to go through building permitting and then and then ultimately build, begin servicing um, midway through the summer. So some key parts of this project. There's a lot of them. Sorry for all the text. Um, 
So our main building partner, or our building partner is Oakwood Homes out of Ottawa, Ontario. Um, I'm not sure if anybody is or isn't familiar with them, but they're one of the, uh, one of the premium uh, home builders in Ottawa. Uh, mostly a custom home builder, but they are getting into the, uh, the larger scale and we're really excited because they actually bring a bit of a different approach home building they have a, a very strong tech backing um, a lot of their their systems that are in place are are really very unique in the home building space so we're excited to have them as a partner um, all the ho all the houses are being designed to a standard called zero net carbon housing and that was a new concept for me too but I learned all about it so what it means is a combination of very high efficiency homes uh, energy usages being a fraction of what a code designed uh, house would have, uh, as well as low carbon in, uh, source material uh, for building materials, everything from, you know, what, you know, obviously the wood, but also, you know, materials for your kitchen, your bathroom, all that. It all goes into a calculation of minimizing the carbon footprint of the house. And ultimately there is offsetting that it's involved in it as well, but basically it's a it's a standard to try to get that house to have a, a net zero <clears throat> carbon input in, impact on the planet, obviously to support the fight against climate change. Uh, additionally, uh, we are planning to build these homes partially in support of what I just said, but also uh, to, really to a, a very, very high quality of uh, high quality standard. Um, we don't want these homes to feel cheap. That is the number one reason we're doing that. We want folks that are living here to feel proud of their houses, to feel that they have something to really show off. And, and ultimately, you know, from a, from a selfish standpoint, higher quality means we don't have as much upkeep because if we use better materials, if we use better construction process, the houses will last longer, they'll look nicer for significantly longer, and ultimately that high efficiency that we're trying to achieve will remain in place for longer. So quality really has a has a overall benefit to everybody beyond just looking nice. Additionally, from a site planning perspective, we designed the stormwater system under principles known as low impact development, and I'm not sure it's relatively new if if so i'm not sure if everybody's heard of it, but basically what it is it's. it's a principle of trying to minimize runoff and encourage as much groundwater re infiltration as possible uh, it's a big push in the city of Ottawa right now, um, but it will be rolling out across the province, likely in a few years and it's a. Uh, point it means that roadside ditches don't don't have as much runoff coming from them and natural systems natural groundwater systems get far more recharge than they would have got uh, under a conventional stormwater pipe uh, now we've designed this to be conservative in the sense that the pipes have been designed such that they don't need infiltration so they're, they're large, their size large enough that they can handle the full capacity, but we know that there will be infiltration in a perforated pipe. So it's a, it's a double check and balance. We did the LIDs, but we also sized the systems large enough that if for whatever reason it doesn't work, it's still large enough and there's no issues with, with flooding downstream or within the development. We made a big focus on native tree species and native vegetation. Uh, this was my second opportunity to work with a landscape architect and very fascinating people and um, when we came to this when we brought them to the site, they were pretty blown away with the amount of opportunity there was on the site to salvage trees to relocate trees and really try to conserve as much of the salvageable vegetation as we can um, through a variety of, of means. Uh, number one, uh, planning the site planning appropriately. Now, unfortunately, 
there's not in within phase one and two there's actually not that much vegetation so this is really um, more for for latter phases. Um, but where we can we're going to be transplanting trees and relocating them into a nursery that we are going to be putting in place on parts of the site that we haven't developed yet. And again, this is not just because we want to pat ourselves on the back from an environmental standpoint. Yes, we, we, we do find it valuable and we want to encourage tree growth, but the way we also see it is, is it's an opportunity to make use of lands that we have, aren't quite ready to develop by growing native species to use on our site. So it's an opportunity to foster tree growth and also conserve trees that are already there while also allowing them to grow in the you know, five years that it takes to act before we actually need them. So we're, we're quite proud of that. And, and right now that's being earmarked for the Western portion of the site um, for, this, uh, for this interim nursery. Additionally, uh, through a partnership with a company uh, out of Europe, we are planning what's called a district heating and cooling system for, for houses within the village. And what does that mean? Most people are fairly familiar with uh, ground source heat pumps. They're, fair, they're starting to come into, into fashion and you know, I'll probably have a friend who has one of those in their houses. <clears throat> Very similar principle except rather than being done for an individual unit, it's being done for a block of units. Approximately 25 to 30 units will be run off a larger heat pump that circulates hot and cold, uh, it's a brine, um, within a circulatory system that is used to heat the houses. There's a couple of reasons we're doing that. Number one, it's very efficient. Most efficient way to heat and cool a home is through ground source heat pumps. That's why people do them in their houses. Number two, by looking at a district system as opposed to individual units, uh, number one, our, there's a lot less infrastructure uh, within a, a fairly dense neighborhood. But we also get economies of scale. You know, by buying larger heat pump systems and servicing a larger number of units with that system, the cost per unit dramatically drops. So in support of lowering the overall oper development and operating costs of our units, we spread that out over a larger number of units and we can actually translate that into lower cost to our individual, to, to our residents. So I'm, we're quite proud of it. And um, that, from what I can tell, might be a first in Canada because I looked and I, I haven't seen any other examples of this being done, but we have the technical backing the systems basically designed already. And, uh, and that's how we intend to, uh, to do this. So I'm, I'm quite proud of it. Phase one and two are going to be conventionally built. And by that, I mean, framers on site, tradespeople coming in and building a house as the way most people would know how to build a house. Phase three and beyond are going to be a little bit different. Uh, phase, the latter phases through our partnership with Oakwood Homes are going to be primarily built offsite. They are in the process of finishing construction on a state of the art manufacturing facility that will essentially use robotic technology to put together 80 to 90% of a house offsite. And then it's shipped in and stitched together with, they call it a stitch crew on the site um, that has a couple of, couple of benefits. Number one, quality control within a manufacturing process is significantly better than, you know, when you're out in the field and trades are coming and going. And uh, so your, your QA, QC is, is significantly better. Cost of production actually goes quite, quite a bit lower like it would with, with any other large manufacturing process. So we can actually build the homes for cheaper than somebody else would be able to do conventionally building it while still maintaining the same spec. Again, this is all in the theme of trying to lower our costs to build, to be able to drive that affordability to our residents. So that's really, really exciting. Um, they're slotted to finish their plant in Q4 2023. So that's why I'm saying it, it will likely be phase three before we actually start 
using these, these uh, offsite houses. I already addressed uh, barrier-free accommodations, um, but just to reiterate it, um, we are uh, providing uh, accommodations and I'll, and I'll show in some of the floor, floor plans a little bit later, uh, barrier-free access for people within in wheelchairs and with, with other mobility issues. Okay. Additionally, just within hold on the, now, Will. Oh yeah, oh sorry, go ahead. You just so just that I don't forget because otherwise if I leave it on um, the with I noticed in in the plans that uh, um, many of these units have in between one and six steps to get into the unit. Um, it's which I, I'm not sure why that is. I'm assuming maybe it's the grade of the the land or what, but it that. You know, people who have mobility issues use canes, walkers. Yeah, we're going to be utilizing ramps in a lot in a lot of the barrier-free cases. Yeah, so part of our architecture group is in those barrier-free units. Obviously, something with a six-step probably won't be one of the barrier-free units, right? But on the the lower step-up ones, we're going to solve that issue by by ramping, which has been a honestly has been a trade-off challenge in in this design because. Um, you're balancing, you know, it would be I'd great if everything was flat. <laughs> uh, you're balancing that with particularly stormwater management issues of trying to bring up the areas in to make sure that nobody's house floods. So in the locations that we can, ramping will be used to, to be able to provide that barrier free access to a uh, to a resident in a wheelchair. Okay, uh, it's just you know, um, given that it is a seniors, you know, built for seniors. I'm not a senior. I have four steps to go into my house, and it's four steps too many already. <laughs> so, um, so you know, I'm not the only one who'd be thinking that. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got so much to say. <laughs> Let it go. Let it go. Go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> no, yeah, um, no. It's, and, and it's a unique. It's a unique challenge. Trust me. And um, that's why sometimes I think, uh, especially on the engineering side, when we come back to our architects and say, "Oh, we got to raise it," and they go, "What do you mean you got to raise it?" But uh, Joanne, you have a question. Right. So it's. I know we're talking about seniors, but we also want to believe that there are a lot of seniors who age in a healthy way. And you know exactly who I'm referring to when I'm saying this. <laughs> My mother's 95, living in her own home with eight steps. So I'm glad to see you have a variety of accommodations so that you can meet the needs of the seniors that choose to live in that particular unit. It looks like you're addressing the different levels of You know, care and it's interesting you say that. Um, and, you know, we we'll go back to this been a bit of a journey. Um, you know, when I first was working on this, that was a that was a key question, you know, and it was in my head, and maybe this is the ignorance of youth, but um, I was like, okay, well, they should all be bar barrier free. And when we started talking to folks and, you know, I, I don't know if anybody in this room attended some of the focus groups, but what the point you just made was exactly the feedback we got is I, you know, people would say, I don't want to feel like I'm living in a, exactly. And, you know, when I'm ready to be there, okay. But today, no, thank you. You know, and there's even, uh, you know, there's even other details within the units, particularly when you get into the bathroom. Um, a fully barrier-free bathroom is sometimes not a, all that appealing to somebody who doesn't need it, right? So that's why really providing a variety of options really was the, was the right answer. It's a more challenging answer, but, um, but that was the way we ended up going. Now, with that said, and you allowed me to segue really nicely into my, my points here, um, within the units themselves, we're actually putting in additional infrastructure to be able to allow people to age in place. So this has been a big theme of this, of this project really from the start. You know, I would consider it a win if somebody lives in the same unit for 15 years and that unit can be changed, altered right, with a relatively minimal amount of work um, <clears throat> as that person ages. So just as an example, uh, grab bars in the, in, in the tub, 
you know, some people need them, some people don't. Uh, well, what we're planning on doing is within the bathroom setting, we're actually putting in the blocking and the backing behind that bathroom wall, whether or not somebody needs a grab bar or not. So the idea is that when, if and when somebody needs that grab bar, you don't no longer need to remove that bathroom wall to put in the appropriate infrastructure back there to be able to install it, it's already there. Um, roofs above the bed. Not everybody needs bed lifts, but some people do. So for the sake of putting in a little bit of extra reinforcement on that ceiling on day one, when somebody needs that, that bed lift, or if and when somebody needs that bed lift, you don't have to do a full retrofit on that roof. You just screw it in and it's already waiting. So there's a lot of little tricks. And, and again, I'll give a lot of credit to our, our architectural team uh, that we're working on to really foster that sense that, some, that this is somebody's home and it will be somebody's home for the long haul as their needs change. And we talked a lot earlier in this process about uh, healthcare monitoring technology, and that's that hasn't gone anywhere. It's just, as you can see, we um, we added a lot to the table. Um, <clears throat> that will be that will be installed in every unit. However, we fully understand and appreciate that not everybody is going to need that or want that. So, optional healthcare monitoring and customized to every person's individual needs will be available within the units. And again, this is really to try to leverage technology to allow people to remain independent and I guess independent is the right word, um, for as long as possible while still being able to primarily provide comfort to their loved ones that they are capable of doing that in, you know, as, as needs change. There's a lot of technology out there for, uh, for aging individuals, as you can probably imagine. Um, I'm quite, I feel quite fortunate in the sense that one of our partner companies works directly in this space and uh, the suite that we're putting forward, not that everybody's going to use every aspect of it, it's going to be quite, is quite impressive. Councillor Madden, you had a question? Uh, Will, just yep. before we get off this slide, go back to your heating and cooling, um, the centralized idea of it. This is this is coming to us as a site plan. Those architectural drawings, those that's what's going to become the site plan. I'm just curious where the buildings are for phase one and two because they're not on there that I saw. The buildings, the, they're little houses, they're little huts, uh, and that we're we're planning on on including that prior to uh, the building, like within the building permit application, as a uh, as a building system. So prior to building, we will be including it, but the hut they're not very big. Okay. I mean, the, 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 the huts themselves are only about 10 by 10, so they don't take up a ton of room. We didn't include them in the site planning because they have no servicing um, and we haven't finalized the exact location on them yet, okay. but it will be included as part of the uh, as part of the building. Permit. Okay, so like the other at some of the, the ends of some of the parking rows, you've got electrical mechanical little structures. Would it be similar to that? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And then. Sorry, yeah. Sorry, I was just to follow on that. So lines, presumably, because I noticed in your legend you had HC heating cooling lines, but there weren't any on the drawing. So presumably those would be those uh, would be on there as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Manley. And just on, while we're on the the ground source uh, heating and cooling, is it a closed loop system then? A horizontal closed loop system? Horizontal is that what closed it is? loop system. Okay. Yeah. All right. There's yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Maybe I'll give you the full rundown of the presentation, but yeah, there's a combination of a of a horizontal loop and, and a deep uh, deep well as well. But anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll say it's a long conversation. Okay, um, two part. Okay, so we're looking at an aerial image of phase one and two, looking from the south. Now, before everybody asks me why are all the units. Uh, black and gray. Um, they won't be. Uh, this is just a, a blocking color that's standard from the architects. The actual units themselves will be will be quite a bit more colorful than this. But I wanted to include this because I think it gives a really good idea and probably better than looking at, an, at a site plan of what we're what we're looking at here with respect to the parquets and, and the angle and the sort of the interaction between the two houses or the, the like rows of houses. 
This picture is an image looking from the north side of the development looking south. And again, I, I wanted to include it because I think it gives a good sense of scale as far as you know, distance between the units, you know, where the paths are located within the individual like blocks of, uh, of homes and really how this, how this all fits together. Additionally, you also see, and this will be clear on, on a later slide I'll show, but you, you notice the, the, the pathway that sort of runs from the bottom of that image and sort of heads off into the distance. So we've designed this as a looped road system within it, and, you, and you'll see that in the full site plan in a moment. But wrapping around the outside of that is this network of pathways that you can, you can see the start of here that is intended to allow people to be able to effectively walk the entire perimeter of the development on a walking path separate from the roadway. Now there is gonna be a walkway adjacent to the road as well, um, but myself, and I would imagine most people would agree with me, being able to walk, going on a walk not adjacent to a road, I think is, is really, really nice. And um, so this, the image that we're looking at demonstrates the first little leg of that loop that's going to go around the, the, the perimeter of the site. Go ahead. Come. Thank you. Um, yeah. <clears throat> on, uh, on your previous slide, um, the units that are the, the row houses uh, that are sort of on the bottom right hand side, mm -hmm. the, the ones that very far right look quite close together. I'm just curious as to what the space, what is the distance between um, one row house and the other at, at its closest? Uh, I'd have to look that number up off the top of my head, or I can't, I don't know it off the top of my head, but there's minimum building separations that are specified in the Ontario Building Code, and they, they meet all those codes um, as far as an actual number on it. But it's, the, the, I don't, I don't want to guess a number. I'd have oh, to get okay. back to you One unit yeah, so there, right on so the that, that that's where the, the discussion on the building code actually comes in and it's primary well there's there's two reasons one is fire and the, and the other is is privacy and. It meets that and, and we actually went through this process in developing the the zoning uh, specific to this uh, to this project. Um, additionally we're using we're using a lot of strategically placed landscaping features that are going to provide additional privacy in those areas that are tight. Um, so there's a few different strategies on dealing with that. And, and that was, again, that was part of a lot of the, the crafting of the zoning zoning bylaws to, to set and deal with privacy and, and, and fire issues. Okay, so this is again similar type of type of image as the one we just looked at, but instead of we're now at the southern portion of the development, looking north. Um, and again, you see there's um, despite the fact that there there's quite a number of dwellings, we've actually managed to get quite a bit of green space in here. And the idea is that anybody has a parquet that's very, very close by to them that they, that they can make use of. And I think this image demonstrates that. Okay, floor plans. So we're looking at the floor plan for the single uh, detached unit. Um, as you can see, it consists of two bedrooms, uh, a covered parking space, um, a large living room, an outdoor patio at the back, which would be the top of the drawing here. Um, and the reason I'm showing two here is, is it shows one is, is, is barrier free and the other one isn't. Um, not a huge difference between the barrier free and non barrier free other than there's some <coughs> slight modifications in the kitchen and and the bathroom is, is a different configuration. Uh, this is our largest unit and it comes in as far as living space a little bit under 1100 square feet um, and. You know, obviously, you know, anybody can rent it, but in our mind, we had this, this type of unit is ideally suited for, for a couple. It's, it has extra space, it has additional storage. You'll see within the garage, there's actually storage built in there as well. Uh, this unit is our semi-detached. 
Uh, it, it's uh, a little bit smaller, but it also consists of uh, two bedrooms, a large living area, same thing, outdoor patio. Um, the storage is now with the, if you look at the, it's the two rectangles at the, the bottoms of the units there. Uh, those are outdoor storage units, obviously, because we don't have a garage in these ones. Um, they are, we needed to provide some sort of space for gardening equipment and that type of thing. So all the units that aren't the singles have these external storage bases in it for, for yard work. And that type of thing. so that's those at the back and they actually, I thought this was quite creative of the architects. They use that as a means of creating a bit of privacy and store, like a, a barrier basically between the two units so that each unit has their own bit of private nook in the back there that they can sit without having to you know stare at their their neighbors that they're inside um, this one here is we're calling it the deluxe row unit so this is the larger of the two uh, it is a one bedroom so now we're into into one bedroom units as opposed to two um, living space it's actually pretty close let's say the one last bedroom it's fairly close to the, the same living space area as the as a semi-detached but obviously the main difference being um, there's only the one bedroom um, all i guess i should specify all the units are intended to have a uh, washer and dryer um, so there's no need for laundry mats or anything like that um, and again these ones also have the uh, the storage units on the outside and finally, uh, we have our standard row unit, which is it is certainly more of a, a modest size. Um, in my head, I, I would think this would be most appropriate for for an individual. I think for a couple, it'd be it'd be pretty tight in there. Not that we would limit anybody, but um, it this one was really designed to provide all those needs of living space while keeping the. Uh, cost as minimal as possible to to allow for people that aren't double income or, or have uh, you know a very fixed income to be able to still live and still participate in the village and as I said earlier even these units are peppered amongst all the other units to really not stigmatize somebody who's living in the smaller units to be, make them feel just as part of the community as as anybody else Okay, so now we're looking at some uh, architectural renderings, nice pictures. Um, this is obviously the one from the, uh, the start of the presentation. But what we're looking at here is one of the connecting pathways into, into the, the core of, of, I believe this one is phase two. Um, you can see the, the covered parking and the single family home there and um, some of the benching that we spec'd with our landscape architect as well as some of the vegetation that uh, that, that, we look, that we're looking to include. Um, I like this one because I think it gives a good sense of, of scale and separation between the units and, and gives a much better sense from a human perspective of what this is actually gonna look like when you're, when you're standing on the ground. So this one is uh, actually just around the corner from where we were just looking. Uh, I had mentioned that that sort of network of pathways that's going to go, go around the circumference of the site. Uh, this is looking north along that pathway. So as you can see, and again, it gives you a good sense of scale of what type of separation distances we have between adjacent row homes. And um, you even see some of the some of the little details of the of the little picket fences that I honestly I quite like, and I think add a lot of charm uh, to to that walk that people are going to be going to be going on. And finally, uh, we're looking at standing in one of the front porches of our, our row units looking out across uh, the gentleman across the way. Uh, again, the, the reason I put these in is I wanted to give everybody a sense of scale of what what this is actually going to look like. And, you know, when I was when I got these images, and I so I debated the architects about how this was going to feel and they swore up and down it wouldn't feel tight and um, I think this image really gives a really good idea of it feels intimate but not overly crowded 
So, uh, so that's why that's why I included in here, and I can really see this this type of setup fostering a good community feel. You know, like I, I'm just I'm standing here and having a conversation with this gentleman really is not a burden. You know, it's close enough that you can talk, and he's going to be able to hear you, right? So that again is is back to this theme of trying to drive community as much as possible. Okay, going forward. So we talked a lot about phase one and phase two. And I know everybody on this council wants to know where is this going? That's a fair question. Um, so we haven't filled in all the sites uh, yet because as you can probably imagine uh, putting together that drawing so that it actually meets all the setback codes and all that is a lot of work, but just to, to kind of paint a picture of where this is going. If you notice, uh, right down the center sort of running in a north south direction is sort of is this meandering path of trees and pathways and and we've our, our design team has dubbed this to be the the green ribbon and it's exactly what it sounds like it's a strip of greenery that really drives everybody the intention is to drive people towards the center of de development to foster you know uh, exercise and 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 uh, and getting together with friends and really creating a, a beautiful third pedestrian throughway right down the center of this now if you notice we actually tied it in to that little extra bit of of land that connects into 43 along the south east portion of the site there uh, that's where we ultimately see the, the connection with the hospital being done on the other side of the road. Now, I know there is a, a network of trails uh, south of 43, and part of our site development plan for the hospital lands is going to be figuring out a way to connect that crossing with the network of trails on the other side of the street. Um, seem like we want people to be able to get to Mill Pond, but we can't have people standing on the side of 43 trying to run across dodging cars, right? So um, creating a proper crossing and, a, and, a, and an appropriate way of, foster, uh, of kind of funneling people to the other side is, is how we're gonna do it. And we're gonna do that through the green ribbon. Um, you'll notice that we've drawn blocking of larger units that are, sort of uh, enveloping the green ribbon, I guess. Uh, the rationale for that, for these higher density units, now, again, we're, we're limited at, um, at three stories, which I think is appropriate for the, this, this property. Um, but those higher density units are going to be closer to the, the main walkways and thoroughfares because we expect that folks that are gonna be, wanna be living in those higher density units are probably gonna be people with, with higher needs uh, from a medical standpoint. So putting them closer to the action, so to speak, um, but also potentially being on the second floor with giving a little bit more privacy, I think just makes an awful lot of sense. Finally, uh, it's not shown on this drawing, but we had talked about commercial entities being part of this uh, development and our, and our zoning is crafted that way. Um, while there will be some smaller um, commercial entities within the within the area around the green room and the bulk of the larger units are uh, larger commercial spaces are intended to be uh, towards the southeast of the development. Um, really, that's makes sense. It's right next to County Road 43 in order to support those businesses and, you know, bring in individuals, customers from that don't live in the village. We wanted to make sure that that those business entities were close to the high, uh, close to the county road so that uh, so that they can take advantage of both. And I think it's just generally good planning to have your have your commercial spaces closer to uh, closer to the road. Uh, from a servicing perspective, we're going to look at this drawing here. Um, the site kind of has a, a natural crown that runs east west and splits it north and south you know right about where that red line is right in the middle of the site so as part of the build out we we intend to actually make use of the the natural topography to service the site primarily from a stormwater perspective that's typically what dictates a lot of a lot of your development design uh, planning 
Um, so with that said, uh, the green that you see in, in, the, uh, in the drawing here is where we're proposing sending our, our major flow routes uh, from a stormwater perspective. Um, and you'll notice that we actually have a route earmarked right down the center of the green ribbon. And the rationale for that is uh, topographically, it actually makes a lot of sense um, that it's, it's a lower lying area. Life of a fire chief. <laughs> Um, but also we, we feel like there's a, a, a huge benefit in creating some water features within that green space right in the center and sort of double, you know, making use of stormwater systems that we have to do anyway, just seem to make an awful lot of sense within that green space in the middle. So that's why we're earmarking some, not all, because it's, uh, it would be too much water to send it all there, but some of the stormwater systems are going to be flowing through that green ribbon to create natural water features again to foster that connection with nature. So the slide we're looking at here is um, a little blurb go on. Ahead. Just hold on with the question. Oh, yeah, yeah, please. Bill, go if ahead. you go back just one. Yep. I'm just, I thought this maybe is a good time to yep. ask this question or whatever. Do you have timelines on, on those, those other phases? We're intending to do one, about one every year. Okay. I mean, obviously, if the market supports it, then we'll, we, we could accelerate that. But as, you know, as a general project planning, we're, we're looking to do about one, one every year. And would you, would you continue west, west from the existing two? Yeah, the, the, that... the working plan right now, I mean, subject to more detailed design right. and, and investigation is to is to expand southwest, I guess it would okay. be, um, and, and then ultimately work our way back north along the eastern side uh, as we go. Yeah. Um, again, I, I don't hold me to that. Because no, no, no. We no I'm just curious what. what... Yeah, that, that's that's the intention. Yeah. You know, ultimately we want to be able to bring commercial spaces in sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. So, getting to that southwest okay. portion. Yeah within a reasonable time frame makes makes a lot of sense to me but again we're i don't want to get too ahead of myself no. like we're right. this is kind of subject to change but that's 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 the what we'll okay. get to thank you we're moving on to other questions uh, count, uh deputy mayor go ahead. please along the same lines um just a, a concern about the the lengthy period to get all of the homes built that that can be accommodated there i mean we're in a like Globally, I don't know whether it's globally, certainly in Ontario, a, a housing crisis. And we really need to get houses built mm -hmm. as quickly as possible. Um, it, I, I, I'm just saying that because it's a concern. Mm -hmm. uh, Ten years down the road, who knows? Maybe, you know, those houses won't be needed, but the crisis is now. For sure. Yeah. And, and this is why support from the community makes a big difference here right um we are looking at the financial markets right now to invest a significant amount of money in in north glengarry and we are taking phase one and two to basically prove that the market is there um, now if through this development process these things i know we're not selling them but you know these things go quick um, then that gives us further justification to to potentially amalgamate phases going forward, do larger chunks. And what I think is a, is kind of our big ace in the hole is is that manufacturing facility with Oakwood that we're that we're going to be uh, working off of because they're going to be able to crank houses out. <clears throat> I think the the limiting factor more than anything to your point there's we need housing but the limiting factor really is going to be how quick the uptake is on on these units and if if it goes the way i'm hoping and the way i think we all think it's going to go then uh, then those timelines certainly will be accelerated i i know if, if we can cut that down to five years for the full build out even better right so that's um Yet to be determined, but I, I try. I don't want to say five years, and then you know it ends up being ten. And I'd rather under promise and over deliver. I guess. <laughs> no problem. 
Okay. So we're looking at here is um, sort of the, the, the five principles of our integrated uh, service and technology delivery. So this has nothing to do with housing, but uh, this is the other aspects of, of the service delivery that we're looking to bring to this community. Um, and I won't spend too much time on this because I know everybody's getting tired, but, uh, but specifically personal health and support care services. Um, that goes back to what we were talking about, customized healthcare plans for people that need it. Uh, wellness and social engagement, that's uh, recreation planning and partnerships with some of the local, um, local groups that are already doing this, this type of work. Uh, site management and operations, uh, we have a, one of our shareholders uh, is a property management company, um, Dory Property Management, who is going to be overseeing all the all the maintenance and you know the, uh, all the things that go into running a uh, running a community. Um, very uh, established track record of property management, and we're we're confident he's going to be able to do it. Uh, information technology, entertainment, and communications—that's uh, the tech side of things, not just related to healthcare, but um, with respect to uh, the internet and, and telephone services and all that. Similar to what you'd see in other apartment buildings. Um, we want to make that as seamless as possible um, and looking at different systems rather than you know for instance conventional phone systems because we're looking to integrate telehealth and, and some of these other more advanced ways of communications um, a big push on on connectivity is is some is a big principle of ours and I already touched on this, but commercial and uh, miscellaneous senior specific services, that would be the, um, uh, the commercial entities, the pet grooming and <clears throat> salons and that type of thing. So, so really the, the goal is to provide a, a space that covers as many of people's needs as possible and as they choose to participate in, because choice is a big, big part too. Um, so that people can do as much or as little within within the village as, as they choose. So finally, I, I added this slide uh, because I think it, you know, it's funny, I have to get so tied up in, in trying to get these these things done and, and the work done, you sort of um, forget about why we started this. So it's it's nice for me to reiterate this. Every person involved in this project and involved in IHA in general, shares these values. And sometimes it's not always easy um, to try to convince folks to take a longer term approach to financial returns, if I'm being honest, uh, isn't always the easiest sell. But everybody involved in our organization approaches this with care and compassion, I'm not going to read them all off to you, but you can read it there. And we have put our team together. So re really where it all starts and this been working on this for four years. Um, so I wanted to communicate this to you that this still is the core of everything that we're trying to do here. And um, we haven't forgotten that. So that is about it for my presentation. Um, I realize uh, that probably went a bit longer than I had intended it to, but, uh, but I appreciate everybody's time and, uh, and I'd be happy to field questions. Okay, uh, thank you, Will. Are there any questions from, um, Councilor Madden. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Will, I just want to go back to parking. Sure. Um, visitor spots? Yes. They'll be designated, presumably? Yes. I so didn't we, see anything we've, on we've, there. We ear, yeah, excuse me. We've earmarked one spot for every unit. And we've all, and I guess I should go back. I should just see it. But basically, there is, uh, it's a good one. So you see the, um, along the road there, there are there's a cutouts yeah. so all those are our street parking for visitor visitor parking and there's actually there's a couple of additional spaces within the within the parking units themselves for for visitors so we've okay. we've earmarked quite a bit of uh quite a bit of visitor parking space good stuff what about um plugins for evs plugins for evs are something that we'd like to do now when we first 
put this out there, it was kind of made clear to us that not too many people have EVs around here. Um, what that said is our intention to put in the electrical infrastructure to be able to install them when people are asking for them. You know, we looked at the pedestals to be able to, to have them there. Okay. Um, and the feedback we got was honestly not very good on, on EVs, but we want to be able to pivot if and when we're, we're ready to put in people, people say that there's a need. For Jacob, you have a comment? <coughs> no. They were, and I know they took it out and it was something I wanted to ask you about, but we haven't had time. But with so, that said, did, but just to address that specifically, EVs are the way of the future. This is and, it. And, and, building in that similar to what's within the units, building in that backing infrastructure and making sure, for instance, our electrical distribution lines are capable of delivering charge to EVs yep. is something that we've insisted with that's Hydro One and with our with our um, our mechanical electrical designers. I was wondering if it was if there was thought of you have a lot of things earmarked as um, future carport. And that was, I think, on previous drawings that we had seen, there was a lot of carport yeah. built in. So, I mean, it would kind of make sense. And really, the only reason I'm thinking is this, we know there are vehicle manufacturers that are going solely electric within the next five to six years. Mm -hmm. So, yes, there's not a massive uptake in this area, but eventually people are not going to have much in the way of choice. So that's... Sure. Yeah, just, no, uh, yeah, we, we, yeah, we built in there. plans to expand that in the future. Um, again, this is always a balancing act of cost control. Right. Um, and in order to make sure that the project was viable and similar to the covered parking, um, we really, it was unfortunately something that we, uh, we had to punt the ball a little bit on that one to make sure that we, we hit those affordability targets, because I think, you know, it was kind of a trade off of putting in, for instance, electrical, uh, charging stations now would cause a bump that would make things slightly less affordable today, Fair right? Fair enough. <laughs> One more question on the parking. Um, in design of this, in, in discussion with your, your architects, uh, what about snow storage or snow removal? Snow, snow is going to be pushed into, for now, into the uh, vacant lands adjacent to the site, but as part of subsequent phases, obviously we're not going to be able to do that. So we're going to be building in snow storage, probably not snow removal. I just, I don't think that's really practical, uh, but building in storage locations that would likely be park space in the summertime yep. um, for snow storage. Okay, good enough. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Councilor Mendel. Um, Will, do you have any idea at this point um, what these units are going to rent for cost-wise? We had, we'd seen some numbers before, I think. Yeah, so like, they... I, I, I don't want to give specific rents because that's not, no, no, hasn't no. been, but yeah, generally we're coming in at around the, you know, 1500 on the low end to, to 2500 on the high yeah. end, okay. but that's, that's still subject to change. So yeah. um, again, like my comment before, don't, don't quote me on that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and are there, are there, are there going to be lease options? Is it month to month? Is it lease option a year or is it? Yeah. So we'll be asking people to sign leases typical for yeah. any, any apartment right. that would, that would be out there. Um, the specific terms of those leases, whether they're one or two, that's going to be developed through our property management company. We're, we may potentially incentivize people to, to, to sign up for longer mm -hmm. through a variety of right. means, but, but it's going to be fairly conventional leases and age restrictions. No. And that was, uh, that was something that we found out as we started dealing with CMHC. Um, we're not technically allowed to, to give age restrictions. Okay. And, you know, even from a, you know, a human standpoint, I guess, you know, I started out with seniors. That's where we, where we started this whole process. And then in doing focus groups and talking to frankly, anybody who would listen to me about it, um, it became clear that there are a lot of folks that aren't seniors that would benefit from a community like this, whether that's an adult with physical or mental disabilities, you know, um, that's probably the, the main one. Um, but people that aren't 60 plus that could benefit from from a community mm -hmm. living such as this. So, so short answer, no. Now, obviously, it's structured such that I don't think it would make a lot of sense for a, a 
family of four yeah. to come live here. Exactly. Um, so, it, you know, it, in, we're not saying no, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for that family to move here. Um, but if it makes sense for an individual to be able to live here, then then I don't, or we won't say no. Let's put it that way. Thank you. Go ahead, Council Madam. Um, we'll just some information in going through the reports, and I suspect it's due to some of the older reports, um, but so that people know because we're getting a lot of questions about this. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I've got something that says 507 senior residential units, 40,000 square feet of commercial, 3,000 square feet of office space, and something else that says seven to 800 units. What's the current? Uh, seven to 800 units. I'm not sure where that, that first one came. Okay. That must have been a much older. Version. And still the commercial and office mix? Yeah, commercial. Probably no, I mean, other than maybe a, like a, a medical clinic or something like that. But, okay. you know, in discussion with the hospital, who are also our, our partners, um, they also have clinic space within their facility. So obviously we don't want to double dip on something that's yep. across the street. So, but when we said offices, I'm, in my head, I thought, you know, maybe a dentist or a, a massage therapy or something like that. Okay, fair enough. Um, there's some traffic and street stuff. I don't think we really need to go into that right now. Anybody else? Well, I see if I have anything else. Any further questions from anyone? Go ahead. Council Wenson. I guess about the cost, I think there's still a group that we're going to have a, a group whose needs we won't be able to meet based upon the rent that you're offering. The facility, the multi-story facility that you're building for seniors with greater care needs, will the cost per month likely be lower than these individual units? Potentially, it's probably a little too early to say on that, and I, I would I would probably defer you to uh, to Steve as part of that that sort of grander conversation about people with with much higher financial needs than that. I know he had had some discussions with uh, some community housing groups around here of of earmarking some units, but I'd be I'd be hesitant to to comment specifically on that today. But do we want to address that population? Yes. Um, how we do it remains to be seen at, the, at this point. Councilor Noble. I was just going to make a comment. Thank you. Um, while we're waiting for Mike, um, as a 16 year old that moved into a house that had been built with someone previously who had been a senior, I absolutely love the crab bar in the shower <laughs> awesome. at every hotel go. I go to. I use it for some reason. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, so I highly recommend you put them in for because everybody, whether you're shaving your legs, you're cleaning them, everybody. <laughs> Everybody can use that yeah. grab bar. I I'll don't know about it. the I'll lift. I'll try it next time I shave Just, my legs. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> I really wish those that was one of those times where you didn't turn on your microphone. But uh, <laughs> okay, you're done. You're good. Okay. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none. Uh, thank you, Will. Uh, is there any process at this point, Sarah? We, that was just for information. Uh, through Mr. Mary, yes. Yeah, so this is just information, and then um, Jacob will be bring back, bringing back the site plan for council approval at a future meeting. That's awesome. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Will. Uh, very much appreciate it. It's, uh, it's a big project, and we're excited about it. So uh, we can't. Uh, it's, as you said, it's been quite a few years. So we're very glad it's coming to fruition. So uh, thank you for your presentation. Today. No problem. Thanks for having me. Great. Thank Take you. care, everybody. Okay, we will move to adjournment. I have a motion moved by Councillor Massey, seconded by Councillor Noble. There being no further business to discuss, the meeting was adjourned at 6.03 p.m. All those in favour? Motion is carried. Thank you, everyone. I thought I was getting to read it.